Hello. Welcome to my channel Touching Stories. You're about to hear an amazing story about love and unexpected decisions. Enjoy watching. Harry and Anthony, two old friends of seven years old, were kicking a ball in a dusty village street. There's my dad coming home from work, Harry shouted excitedly. Well, are you guys playing? A smiling man came over. Well, who's first to the gate? Anthony, come on, get in. The gates were two small logs placed in the middle of the street. Anthony, laughing merrily, took his place in the improvised gate, took the goalpost and prepared to repel the shot. Hurrah, hurrah, I hit it. He jumped with joy. Well, well done. You outplayed me, friend. The man continued to smile. Uncle Billy, let's do it again, Anthony asked. No, I'll do it. Harry gave Anthony a friendly push out of the gate. Dad, will you score for me? Score, you say? There you go. Goal. No, that's not fair. Harry was upset. I didn't get ready in time. Let's do it again. Let's take turns. Come on, Anthony. Hooray, hooray. He did it again. The boy was so happy. You're gonna be a famous goalkeeper, Anthony, aren't you? You'll make our village famous. Get back. Harry shoved him, frowning. Catch it. His father shouted cheerfully. Goal. Oh, Harry, you'll never be a soccer player. Well, the ball was right at your feet. How did you get it so far? I don't know. Harry's distress was so great that he burst into tears. Well, well. His father smiled indulgently, patting his son's disheveled hair. It's a shame to cry over such nonsense. You're a grown-up. You'll be going to school in two months. Now someone will see you. They'll tease you later. Dad, Harry held out his arms to him. His father picked his son up as lightly as a piece of lint and carried him towards the house. Anthony was left alone and looked enviously at Uncle Siriosha's departing footsteps. How lucky Harry was. His father was so strong, with big arms and broad shoulders. I wish Anthony had a father like that. Only he has no father at all. Well, why is it so unfair? How is he worse than Harry? Anger, resentment, disappointment all mixed up inside Anthony at that moment. In this impulse, gathering all the strength of his small, tan feet in shabby old sandals, Anthony forgot about everything except the ball lying in front of him. He did not feel the weight of his own body at that moment, and his eyes blurred with tears. The sound of broken glass made him wake up. The terrible and irreparable act made his chest tighten. Anthony squeezed his eyes shut to the point of pain. How can I undo the misfortune now? I'm going to get it, went on in his mind. Oh, you rascal. He heard old Selena shout belatedly. I'll get you. I'll bring you up with nettles. And who's going to fix my window now? Your grandmother or your mom? You don't have a man in your house. Anthony ran as fast as he could to get away. He was ashamed, scared. He had to hide somewhere until things calmed down a bit, and he shouldn't come home before dark. Anthony ran to the outskirts of the village and laid down in the soft grass. He was hungry, and his stomach rumbled treacherously. His mother and grandmother were probably eating dinner right now. But no, he couldn't go home. Neither Anthony's mother nor grandmother had ever punished him severely, but what if they had nasty Selena sitting there right now? She'd definitely been to their house by now, told them what he'd done. The boy was afraid of Selena like fire, in fact, like all the local children. Well, it had to happen. If I was going to break a window, it wasn't going to be to her. Anthony thought of this father again. If he had a father like Harry's, no Selena would be scary. Anthony didn't notice as the sun began to go down. The mosquitoes that had been sitting out the heat of the day somewhere in their invisible hiding places began to come out for the evening hunt, causing Anthony a lot of trouble. No, it is necessary to be a little more patient. Selena, she is more terrible than any mosquitoes. Anthony already got nettles from her once. It became dark. His hands and feet itched unbearably from numerous bites, Anthony cried. Son, Anthony, where are you? The boy, hearing his mother's voice, quieted down and looked out of his hiding place. The mother was alone. Mother, I'm here, Anthony shouted. What the hell are you doing, huh? What are you hiding for? My grandmother and I have been all over the village, and she's running around the neighbors. Isn't Selena here? She's gone. Oh, son, you've made a mess of things. Where are we going to get this glass? We'll have to go to town to get it. And then we'll have to ask someone to install it. I didn't mean to. Anthony whimpered again. 
Did she swear a lot? Very much. You must be careful, son. You mustn't play in the street among the houses. Where should we play? Play in the playground by the store. There are bars on the windows. You won't break them. Okay. Okay, mom. The boy got a little cheerful. You know who we played soccer with today. Oh, that soccer. Sighed heavily mother. With whom? Dad. Even so. He couldn't score a single goal for me. The boy shone. Forgetting his troubles. Uncle Billy said I was going to be a soccer player. Harry's got a good daddy. Mama, why does Harry have a daddy and I don't? Everyone in the village has one. Only me and Natalie don't. Why don't you tell me? Anthony, you've asked me that many times, I told you. What's he doing up there in the north? Why hasn't he ever come to see me? At least for my birthday. He has a lot of work to do and it's a few days away. Am I never going to see him again? I don't know, Anthony. Anthony got a kick out of Grandma, not so much for the broken glass, but for taking so long to find him. You rascal, I'll twist your ears off, Grandmother shouted, and putting her threat into action, grabbed Anthony's ear painfully. You've made a mess of things and hid. Have you thought of me and Mother? We've been looking for you all night. It's nighttime. My heart is sick. I've taken all the medicines I can get my hands on. Grandma, I'm sorry. The boy whimpered. I was just scared. Selena, I won't do it again. Never ever again. And I won't play soccer near the houses, I promise. Go to bed. It's getting late, said Grandma in a peaceful tone, finally letting go of Anthony's ear. Anthony rushed to his room, jumped on the bed and hid with his head under the blanket. It was hot, but he didn't want to get out. On the contrary, he wanted to burrow even deeper. In all the commotion, both his mother and grandmother had forgotten that Anthony had not had dinner. He was very hungry, but out of a bitter sense of guilt, he was too embarrassed to ask to be fed. After crying, Anthony got out from under the blanket. He couldn't sleep. Usually at this time, though, after running around outside all day, he was already fast asleep. Anthony sat up, swinging his legs off the bed. A ray of Aryan light slipped under the door, and someone turned on the kitchen light. Hearing voices, the boy tried to listen, but his mother and grandmother were talking softly, in low voices. Anthony stood up and carefully opened the door. My sandals are all torn up, and I'm ashamed to go to work, he heard his mother's voice. I thought I'd go to town on the weekend and buy new ones, but now I don't have time for sandals, I have to buy glass, then pay for it to be brought and put. Yes, our little boy has done something wrong, oh, has done something wrong, and the sandals, Take them to Petrovich. He's a master. He'll fix them. What's there to patch up? They had been patched four times already, and through the ajar door Anthony could see his mother wiping her tears at the window. Anthony couldn't bear to watch the mother he loved so much cry. Unable to contain his worries, he cried and rushed to his mom. He wrapped his arms around her legs and said, Mommy, my darling, you are so good. I will never upset you again. When I grow up, I will give you the prettiest sandals and you won't cry. Come, Mommy, tell me a story. Anthony even forgot about hunger. He wanted to stroke Mommy's head, but she was so tall he couldn't reach her. He held out his arms to her. Mom crouched down. Anthony hugged her, stroked her face and said, Sweetheart, my sweetheart, my sunshine. He had heard those words from his mom. She always said them when she put Anthony to bed. No one had a mom like his, beautiful, kind, affectionate. Anthony loved to touch her face to hold her hands. Her hands were wonderfully soft, warm, dimpled, and her hair was like no one else's, thick, silky. And when my mother let her hair down, it fell to her waist, and it seemed as if you could wrap yourself in it like a shawl. I'll tuck you in, mother said affectionately. It's nighttime. Mother, tell me about my father. What's his name? Is he tall? It's time to sleep, son. No, I'm not going to sleep. Anthony jumped out of bed. Well, tell me please. Archie. Archie Walker. No, not Walker. But I'm a walker. My friend Harry and his daddy, Uncle Billy, have the same last name, Stone. Why does my daddy have a different last name than me? Anthony, you're a little kid. You wouldn't understand. I'm tired all day today. I have to get up early for work tomorrow. Let me read you a story. His mother began to read Anthony a story, 
He closed his eyes and pretended to fall asleep. Anthony felt his mother carefully covering him with a blanket, heard her leave the room. Sleep didn't come. Anthony thought about his father again, tried to imagine what he was like. Was he as strong as Harry? No, his father was even stronger. He's the strongest, and someday they'll meet. Anthony, why don't you come out? Harry came to him around noon. Let's go play. The boy was holding a ball. No, I'm not going out today. Go play with the other kids. I know what you did yesterday. You got hurt pretty bad, didn't you? I didn't get hurt. I just don't feel like playing today. All right, I'm gonna go. Wait, Harry. Anthony remembered what his mother used to tell him. Don't play ball in the street. Go to the playground by the store. There's bars on the windows. You won't get hurt. And yet you got it. Harry sighed. On the weekend, they brought glass for Selena from the city to replace the broken glass. Billy Stone came to the walkers and offered to help them install the glass. How much would you charge for the job? Anthony's mother asked. Oh, come on. What money? I won't take a penny from you. I just want to help the neighbor. Billy smiled. Oh, I don't even know how to thank you. The woman was confused. You don't have to thank me. It's no trouble. Well, Anthony, shall we go? Where to, Uncle Billy? Where to? To Grandma Kathy's. You're gonna help me change the glass. Oh, Anthony was horrified. I won't go to her. What do you mean? You're not going. No, man, you gotta take responsibility for your actions. You've done bad things, and why should others have to take responsibility for them? No, no, I'm not going to her. Anthony shook his head. Billy, wouldn't it be dangerous if Anthony helped you with the glass? He might cut himself. Oh, really, Angelica? Of course, I won't let a child work with glass. But Anthony must apologize. Yes, yes, I agree with you completely. Go, Anthony, with Uncle Seriosha. Go and apologize. No, Mommy, please. She's mean. She nettles me. Anthony clung to his mother. Hey, buddy, what are you scared of? I'll be there for you. I'm not gonna hurt you. Come on, let's go. Uncle Billy held out his hand. Anthony waved his head slightly and put his small hand into Uncle Billy's huge palm. The boy immediately felt reassured and protected. If he had a father, nothing and no one would be afraid of him. You rascal. You've ruined my property. Selena shouted as she saw Anthony approaching the house. Aunt Kathy, said Billy calmly but sternly. Don't yell. Anthony's here to apologize. And I'll fix your property right away. The glass is here. I'm sorry, Anthony said lowering his head. I won't do it again. I'll only play soccer outside the store. He's a good soccer player. Anthony tussled Billy's disheveled hair. Don't scold the boy, Aunt Kathy. All right, she muttered grudgingly. Anthony was very curious to see how Uncle Billy worked. The boy began to think about his father again, how many interesting things he could teach him. A little over a year later, Anthony was in the second grade. In the village where he lived, there was only a primary school, and the older children went to a nearby village to study. Guys, the teacher said to the class, winter is approaching and it will probably be cold. I propose to help our lesser brothers. Let's each of you make a birdhouse. We'll hang four birdhouses in the village, one on each street. Three more in the forest on the outskirts of the village. Not every forest bird dares to fly to people. But I don't know how to make birdhouses, objected one of the girls. You could say that this is a task for your dads. I'm sure they'll get an A on it, smiled the teacher, and Anthony's face flashed with color. Yes, guys, let's not forget about our faithful friend, Hulk and the dog, a favorite of the whole village. He should have a box, because everyone should have a home. Who can make a house for Polkin? My dad will do it, Harry said proudly. He can do anything. Mine can do it too. Mine can do it too. My daddy's a carpenter came one after another of the voices. Everyone was shouting, but Anthony sat with his head in his shoulders, and at that moment he wanted to fall through the ground. Anthony came home upset. What's wrong? Grandma asked. Did you do something bad at school again, you mischief maker? I didn't do anything. By the way, I got an A in reading. Good for you. You can do it when you're old. It's your first A in reading, isn't it? First, Anthony shown forgetting his disappointment. That evening, when the family sat down to dinner, Anthony told them about the assignment the teacher had given them. What kind of nonsense your teacher came up with? Grandma was indignant. Well, look at that, huh? 
How can a child of eight years old make a birdhouse? The teacher said it was a homework assignment for dads, Anthony said in a low voice. There was a piercing silence in the kitchen, which Anthony broke. Mom, Grandma, can't you guys help me? Everyone will do, I alone won't bring anything. Shame. No son, said Mom, pulling Anthony close to her. Neither me nor Grandma can help you. I'm sorry. Anthony finished his homework and went to bed. But what kind of sleep is that? Sometime later, hearing voices in the kitchen, Anthony opened the door slightly. Oh, Angelica, you need a man in the house. I've been saying that for a long time. Your husband, Anthony, is your father. You're not getting any younger, you're getting older. Well, you've had one. Don't you like him at all? I don't know, Mom. Angelica said indifferently, he seems to be a good man. You're always thinking of Archie, aren't you? Anthony's ears perked up at the mention of his father. Where is he now, Archie? After all these years, he never once remembered you or his son. He didn't know. What? You didn't tell him you were having a child. Angelica didn't answer anything. Holding back her tears, only shook her head. What a fool you are, my daughter. Well, how could it be so? He had to know. And why, Mom, if this one came to him? Yes, you've done something wrong. If you told him about the baby, maybe things would have turned out differently. Things wouldn't have been different. How can you forgive that? Archie and Angelica were born and bred in the same village, lived on the same street. Angelica was a mischievous girl who preferred to play with boys, so Archie became her best friend. They were the same age, went to elementary school together in the village, then together they went to high school in the village. By the time they were 16, their childhood friendship had grown into a mutual crush. At the same time, 20 kilometers from their home village opened a coal deposit. A small mining village grew almost a year. Archie's father was offered a job at the mine. The conditions were good. The family was given an apartment in a two-family house and a large plot of land. Archie did not want to leave and part with Angelica, but his parents had already decided everything. As soon as Archie finished the 10th grade, his parents sold the house and the move took place. For a whole year, Archie went to Angelica's house every weekend. In the summer, they walked to the club in the nearby village, dancing, not taking their eyes off each other. Archie often borrowed oars from his former neighbor, and he and Angelica would go to the river and go boating. There seemed to be no people happier than that couple. It was a fickle march. Archie always left on the last bus. Angelica went to see her lover off at the bus stop, but the bus didn't come, it broke down on the way. Archie stayed the night at Angelica's house, much to her mother's displeasure. What a shameless thing to do. How can he stay here? Is he your husband? She grumbled. Tomorrow, the whole village will be talking about it. Do you think people don't see anything? Mom, he can't sleep outside, can he? Archie, sitting in the chair, stood up coughed nervously and said in a slightly shaky voice, Angelica, I'm asking you to be my wife. What? Mother was indignant. What do you think you're doing, Archie? She's not 18 yet, and you'll be in the army soon. Angelica will be 18 in three weeks, Archie argued. Angelica, I want us to be man and wife before I go into the army. I agree, Angelica said quietly and tears of happiness flowed down her beautiful face. Angelica and Archie had a noisy happy wedding. There were many guests, mostly young people. A month later, Archie left for the army, and the young wife waited for her husband in his house. Archie left with a peaceful mind. No, of course, he did not doubt Angelica's fidelity for a second. He was sure that she would wait for him. But it was one thing to be waited on by the girl you loved, another by your lawful wife. Archie left, and the months and days of waiting dragged on. Her parents-in-law were not bad to Angelica, but there was no warm and close relationship. Angelica missed her home, missed her mother. She would have been more comfortable waiting for Archie there at home, but she could not help it. She was her husband's wife now. Her place was in his house. The two years dragged on incredibly long. Archie was serving far away, he wrote often, each letter with ardent lines of love. Angelica was not as good a writer as Archie, but she wrote every day. Sometimes Archie received two letters in one envelope, one written in the morning and the other in the evening. These letters smelled of home. They were a ray of sunshine among the gray army everyday life. 
Archie had four months to serve, or rather 127 days. Yes, Angelica was counting the days. A letter came, with the same lines of love. Only for some reason at the end of the letter there was an incomprehensible note. Forgive me, Angelica. When Angelica read this short line, the earth went from under her feet. She did not understand what her husband was apologizing for, but she felt that something irreparable had happened. Angelica tried to find out from Archie what that line meant. He replied that he missed her very much and apologized for being away for so long. This answer did not satisfy Angelica, of course. She knew her husband well and realized that the reason was something else. Archie wouldn't write those words just like that. So he was seriously guilty of something in front of her. The question was, what was it? Angelica waited anxiously for Archie's return, all because of that short note in the letter. The long-awaited and exciting day came. Archie returned. Angelica did not notice any changes in him. Cheerful, loving, caring. The first night they went to the club and danced heartily there. From the club they ran to the river. The main night was warm, the air was clear and transparent. Angelica, pressed against Archie's strong shoulder, looked at the starry sky. At that moment it seemed to her that they were alone in the universe. Archie, after two weeks rest, got a job at the mine. Angelica worked as a sales clerk. Life went on as usual, ordinary family life. A month and a half had passed since Archie's return. The day was cool and gloomy. Sometimes it began to drizzle. A young girl came into the store with a traveling bag, clearly not from the country, or rather from the city. It's horrible how dirty this village is. She began to wail from the doorstep. My shoe heel has come off. Where can I get a shoe heel? We have nowhere. Angelica was confused. Do not go to us in shoes. You have to go to the city. The bus will pass in an hour. Well, it's not about that now. I've come such a long way. Give me some mineral water. We don't have mineral water. We only have citro. Well, what kind of seltzer? It's all sugar. What a wilderness. You can't even drink water. Would you like to come home to my house and get you drunk? No, thanks. Tell me, where does Archie live? Archie. Angelique's heart sank. What do you want him for? Her voice trembled. Young lady, what business is it of yours why I want Archie? Will you tell me where he lives or not? Archie is my husband, Angelica said firmly and confidently. Angelica, you mean? Yes, Angelica. How do you know me? I'm Leslie. Archie didn't tell you anything about me or rather about us. At that moment, a customer entered the store who immediately paid attention to the stranger. Oh, Angelica, is this a bad time? I see you have a checkup, right? No, Aunt Shuri, this is not a test. Where did you come from? Aunt Shuri looked Leslie over from head to toe. Woman, did you come here to shop or to look at other people? The girl replied sharply. You're rude. I see your parents didn't teach you how to talk to your elders. You've painted your shameless eyes. Aunt Shuri, did you come for matches or sugar? Angelica intervened. So it's my husband's birthday today. He's 45. We're married for almost 25 of them. Our silver wedding anniversary is in two months. Angelica, is the sausage fresh? It arrived yesterday. Weigh me half a kilo. We've got everything else, all our own. Congratulate Uncle Vidya for me. Angelica found the strength to smile. Ooh, rude leaving, threatened Aunt Shuri Leslie. The appearance of Aunt Shuri allowed Angelica to come to her senses a little, the stupor released a little, but the nervous trembling did not go anywhere. Angelica had already been feeling ill since early morning. Speak, she said with colorless lips. Leslie seemed to enjoy telling her that she had met Archie about six months ago, when he was on leave and walking in the park. Archie had taken an immediate liking to her, and Leslie had approached him and suggested that they take a walk together. The walk was pleasant and they agreed to meet a week later. Their meetings in the city became regular, then Leslie began to invite Archie to her house, fed him delicious home-cooked food. And the fact that he had a wife. Angelica couldn't listen to any more of this, she was shaking. So what? My dear, everyone fights only for his happiness, the girl grinned haughtily. But you are obviously older than him, exclaimed Angelica, why do you need him? Yes, I am older by three years. What does age have to do with it? We're both adults. Why did you come here? Don't you get it? I'm here for Archie. 
Angelica's eyes flashed back to a bunch of memories. She remembered Archie proposing to her, out of the blue. She remembered sitting on the riverbank when Archie came back. Just the sky, the stars, him and her. There would be no more of that. No silver wedding like Aunt Shuri and Uncle Victor's. Angelica will never forgive him. Well, well, said Angelica. She tried to hold on with all her might not to show her rival how much it hurt her. It's lunchtime soon. Archie's coming home for lunch. Let's go. To be honest, I had a different idea of how I thought we'd meet. I thought you'd make a scene and throw yourself at me. What's the point? What would it change? Angelica said in a detached tone. And you, my dear, I see that your husband is indifferent. Leslie grinned. Angelica remained silent. She would have liked to say, yes, I do, but she couldn't say such a lie. Go, Angelica said, straight down that street to number seven. I'll close the store and come up. Angelica didn't want to walk through the village with Leslie. When Angelica arrived, Leslie was sitting on a bench outside their house, taking some things out of her travel bag and wearing flat-soled sandals instead of shoes. To think, she grinned. That 20 years ago, our cosmonaut flew into space for the first time. And civilization hasn't even reached your village, not even asphalt. I've broken a new heel. Leslie looked at the heel. You'll have to be patient. I don't think you'll be here long. I hope so. Angelica opened the house and gestured for the intruder to enter. Archie's parents were at work, and they always ate lunch in the canteen at the mine, never coming home. Come into the kitchen, Angelica said dryly. Archie should be here in 10 minutes. You should at least offer tea. Leslie acted arrogant and haughty. She felt she was the boss of the place. In fact, she always felt that way in every situation. Wait for Archie. You'll have tea with him. Angelica went to her room, her and Archie's room. She wanted to throw herself on the bed and gnaw on the pillow with her teeth from the overwhelming grief. But Angelica held on. Through the window, she saw Archie approaching the house, heard the front door open. Everything was like a blur. Honey, I'm home. Look what I brought you. What did you bring me, honey? Leslie came out of the kitchen. Leslie, what are you doing here? How did you get in here? Archie dropped the metal weld that rose from his hands in surprise. Surprise, said the girl playfully. She was obviously pleased with the effect. Where's Angelica? She's in her room, locked herself away from me, didn't even give me tea. She said you were going to give me tea. Leslie, what are you talking about? You're out of your mind. Go away, please. Go now. Angelica. Archie opened the door of the room wide. Angelica was packing her things. No, no, this is a mistake. Please, don't take it out on me. Don't do anything stupid. I'll explain everything to you. Don't bother, Archie. I've been told everything by your... I don't know who she is. I'm not letting you go anywhere, so listen to me. This is a mistake. Just let me go. I'm going to miss my bus. Leslie's waiting for you. She's here for you. Angelica, I'm sorry. Archie tried to hug his wife, but she pushed him away. I'm sorry. I remember those words you wrote in the letter. I didn't know what they meant, what you were apologizing for. Well, it's all clear now. I won't forgive you, Archie. I can't. Angelica said the last words in a low voice, her lips trembling. Archie stood silent, palms pressed to his flaming cheeks. Angelica picked up her duffel bag and left the room. In the hallway, she tripped over the flower Archie had dropped. Angelica stopped, squatted down and picked up the flower. The touch of hot skin against cold metal felt good. Angelica stood up abruptly and ran out of the house. The flower remained in her hand. Angelica left for her mother's house, not knowing that right after she left Archie had rudely kicked Leslie out the door and thrown her bag out the window. Archie thrashed around the house, tearing his hair out. He had made an irreparable mistake. Leslie was a mistake. He didn't need anyone but his wife. But there's no going back. One can only hope that time will pass and Angelica will be able to forgive him. On her way home, Angelica stopped by the HR department and quit the store. She will not return to the village where she was so happy this morning, seeing her beloved husband off to work. Oh, Angelica, what happened? The mother was stunned when she saw her daughter with a bag on the doorstep. Only now, having crossed the threshold of the native house, Angelica gave free rein to her feelings, tears flowed from her eyes. Her mother could not immediately understand the reason for her daughter's tears. 
it was impossible to understand the words spoken through the sobs. Angelica lay on her bed for three days, staring at the wall and holding the iron rose in her hands. Her mother sat next to her, stroked her head and tried to calm her down, to convince her that everything would get better between her and her husband. Although knowing her daughter, she herself did not believe in it. On the fourth day, Archie arrived. He wanted to go to Angelica the same day she left. It didn't matter that the buses were out of service. He was prepared to walk the 20 kilometers that separated them. His mother and father, having listened to the son's confused story, advised him to wait a bit, to give Angelica time to calm down, to come to her senses. But the conversation did not work. Angelica was categorical. I will not forgive you. Leslie did not go home. She rented a room in the district center and every day visited Archie's home, but he did not let her even on the doorstep. Archie never gave up trying to beg his wife's forgiveness. He came all the time, with flowers, live, not iron. Angelica did not want to listen to anything and did not accept the flowers. A month passed. Archie came to see Angelique again. I quit my job. Let's go away. I bought three train tickets, two for you and me, southbound. The third one to the north. I'll be waiting for you at the train station on Saturday. Our train leaves at 14 o'clock. You and I need to leave. We can still start a new life. If you don't come, at 1740 I'll leave alone for the north. If I come back, it won't be soon. I can't stay here any longer. Angelica was silent. Come please. I'll be waiting for you very much. Archie tried to look into his wife's eyes, but she looked away. At 1740, Archie took the train. Angelica never told him that they would soon become parents. Her resentment was too great. He had hurt her too much. A week after Leslie arrived, Archie and Angelica had a conversation. Archie, I'm filing for divorce. I'm not giving you a divorce. Let's just wait a little while. Let time pass. Time won't change anything, Archie. I can't forgive you. How could you? I trusted you for two years. I waited two years. I only left the house to go to work. And you? It's my fault. There's no excuse, I know. But I don't want to let you go. Don't try to force me away. I'm not coming back to you, Archie. Well, all right. I'll do what you want. What else can I do? Then we'll get married again. Archie's cheered up, cheerful. That's never gonna happen. Time will tell. The couple filed a consent decree. Archie still hoped that Angelique would change her mind within a month, but it did not happen. They were divorced two days before Archie left. Angelica reverted to her maiden name. She registered for pregnancy only after the divorce. Archie wrote Angelica three letters, but she did not respond to any of them, then stopped writing, realizing the futility. Angelica wanted to erase from her memory everything connected with her ex-husband. It hurt too much. It seemed to her that now, when Archie was so far away, it would be easier for her, it would be easier to forget. But months passed, and in her soul was still the same universal longing, and how could Angelica forget Archie? If she was carrying their child under her heart, the birth of their firstborn was expected at the very end of February. The year was a leap year, and Angelica was afraid that the baby would be born on the 29th of February. Not today, be patient, baby. Angelica said when she felt the first signs. Anthony did not fail. He was born at four in the morning on March 1st. Three weeks later, Angelica received a letter from Archie. In the letter, Archie told a little about himself. He moved to another city, even farther from his hometown, got a hard but well-paid job. Archie wrote that he thought about her all the time, and today she had been on his mind all day. The letter was dated February 29th, and Archie felt something. Please answer me, he wrote. Are you well? Are you healthy? I'm worried about you. Angelica, if I do not receive a letter from you within a month, I will ask my parents to go to you to find out. Angelica couldn't have her former parents-in-law coming to see her grandson. Her reply to Archie was short. I'm fine, happy, healthy. Archie didn't write any more letters, having decided that Angelica was not happy alone. He wasn't going to interfere with her happiness. Time passed, Archie and Angelica's son was already in his ninth year, and his father still didn't know he existed. In the harsh northern lands, there were many applicants who wanted to marry a young man, but Archie subconsciously compared all potential brides with Angelica. 
The comparison was clearly not in favor of the latter, so he remained an enviable bachelor. Angelica had had suitors over the years, but she didn't want her son to have a stepfather. Angelica thought back to her childhood years, she and her best friend had lost their fathers early on. Angelica's mother never remarried and Ariana, the friend, had a stepfather. Ariana's relationship with her stepfather did not work out. She ran away from home several times. The family was not uncommon scandals, but Angelica and her mother lived peacefully, although it was not easy to have in the material plan. Now Angelica's mother was stunned to learn that her daughter did not tell her former son-in-law that he would soon become a father. Angelica, he must know. How could he? Anthony asked about his father all the time. Do you know where Archie lives? You must write to him. You must write to him. I won't do it. You're stubborn. You're so stubborn, just like your father. The next day, Angelica's mother went to see Selena. Listen, Kathy, I need your help. Oh well. I thought you knew the whole 50-kilometer area. I'll give you a buzz. Any of Archie's relatives around here? Why are you bringing up your ex-brother-in-law? I did. Do you have any relatives or not? I heard his parents are dead. That's right. So there's no one. I know my father had a sister, his aunt. She lived in Rishikino. But whether she's alive or not, I don't know. Rishikino. It's a bit far. Well, thank you, Katie. So tell me, I'm really curious, why do you want Archie? Are you trying to set Angelica up with him? Maybe I do. I'm surprised at you. Your son-in-law has run away from his wife. He won't even look at his child. The next day, Angelica's mother took the first bus early in the morning to Rizzuchino. Mom, where are you going? Angelica was surprised when her mother got up bright and early. Yes, daughter, I have to go to an acquaintance. I got a letter from her. She was ill. The village of Rizukino was small. Angelica's mother easily found out that Archie's aunt had already died, but she had two sons who lived there. Who are you? Asked a tall bearded man who was tending the garden. What do you want with Archie? I'm his ex-mother-in-law. Mother-in-law? What do you want from him? The man looked at him incredulously. I want to tell him something. No, I won't give you his address. Well, write to him yourself that he has a son. He's nine years old. My stupid daughter didn't tell Archie anything when they broke up. What are you making up? It's not true. Why don't you write it down, please? Here, Steve's picture. Send it to me. He looks like him. The bearded man changed his tune. You write, let Archie decide whether it's true or not. Anthony wandered sadly out of the school. He was bitter and resentful. All his classmates had made birdhouses, or rather, not themselves, of course, but their fathers. Even his alcoholic father had made one. Anthony alone had nothing to boast about. Don't be upset, said Anna, a perky classmate. It's not your fault. My dad made it for me, and you don't have a father. That's what you call comforting. Harry's father made a box for Polkin, the village's favorite dog. The box was ceremoniously installed near the school, and Polkin immediately took his place in it, saying, Woof, in approval. Three weeks passed. Lessons at school were over, but Anthony was in no hurry to go home. Today, he was so frolicsome at recess that he tore off the October star, as they say, with meat, and an impressive hole was formed on the flap of his breast pocket. Now grandmother would see. Anthony would get it. Oh, he would get it. Anthony wanted to postpone this unpleasant moment. It was the end of October. The first snow had fallen, lightly dusting the ground. Anthony stopped outside one of the houses and wrote in large letters. Mom, Anthony, Dad. What are you doing there? He heard Selena shout harshly. He was lucky to have stopped right outside her house. Run was Anthony's first thought. He looked around and saw a strange man walking down the street. The man was well-dressed, clearly urban, carrying a suitcase in one hand and a travel bag in the other. Run away from my house, Anthony heard again. You've already given me a hard time once. At that moment, the stranger approached Selena's house. Oh, hello, she said embarrassed. I didn't expect you to come to our neighborhood. Hello, the man replied, bowing slightly, and walked further down the street. Selena stood looking at the man. Anthony stood there too, completely oblivious to the threat coming from her. Selena said as the stranger disappeared around the corner, Run already, your dad's here. You're not lying. 
Anthony was stunned. How could you possibly know my dad? He's a local, born in our village. Well, look how long I haven't seen him, and he hasn't changed a bit. Anthony stood there swallowing his tears, unable to move. Well, run, meet him, Selena said encouragingly, and the boy ran without feeling any support. Anthony cautiously opened the front door and quietly, like a mouse, crept into the house. It seemed to him that all this was not true, a dream, a fairy tale, that Selena had deceived him. But no, there were a man's shoes at the doorstep. Anthony should be home from school by now. He heard his grandmother's voice from the kitchen. He must have run in to see his friend Harry. And Angelica's at work till tonight. Now, Archie, I'll make you some tea. Here, hot. I made pies yesterday. Archie. My mother told me my father's name was Archie. So Selena was right. Anthony stood behind the wall, hesitant to leave his hiding place. Finally, he took an uncertain step. Everything trembled inside. Anthony was unusually embarrassed and subdued. He stood with his arms folded at the seams and squinted at his grandmother. Grandmother's demeanor was surprising. She appeared as confused now as Anthony. Grandmother fussed around the kitchen, awkwardly pushed the tea glass, spilling the contents onto the snow-white tablecloth, then came over and grabbed Anthony's hand tightly. Anthony, she said nervously and then stopped talking. Let me tell you myself. The man got up from his chair. Anthony, I am your father. Anthony was afraid of something and lowered his head. Well, said Grandma affectionately, you always asked about your daddy. Here, he came. With unblinking eyes, Anthony stared stubbornly at the floor. He knew what he had to do now. He had to go over and hug and kiss her. He had dreamed of this for so long. How many times he had imagined this long-awaited meeting. But Anthony still stood there, feeling only one thing. There was a stranger in front of him, whom he didn't know at all. Anthony realized that it was not good to stand so solemnly as he was standing now. What to do? The task was almost insoluble. He lifted his head and looked into his father's eyes, as gray as his own, and immediately felt better. The fact was that his father himself was far more confused than Anthony and his grandmother. He was smiling, but it was very shy and embarrassed. Father probably didn't know what to say or what to do. Grandma helped them both out. Anthony, come to your father, she said firmly. The boy obediently walked over. Oh, what a big son I have. Archie ruffled the boy's disheveled hair. Anthony noticed the tears in his eyes. Oh, Archie, I spilled your tea. Now, now, I'll boil some more. Grandma fussed again. In fact, she was crying too and didn't want to show it. And I've got some more soup to boil. Will you tell me how school is going? Dad asked, still smiling embarrassed. Anthony was still standing in his jacket, unbuttoning it and showing the hole in the pocket of his school jacket. Here, I tore my jacket and lost my badge, Anthony said quietly, almost in a whisper, looking over at his grandmother, who was at the stove. Archie suddenly laughed. He laughed hard, heartily and loudly, without embarrassment, and Anthony smiled too. Well, I see you're a quick little fellow. The interesting thing is that once the same thing happened to me, Archie grabbed him in his arms and started throwing him up to the ceiling. Anthony was delighted to discover what a nimble and powerful man his father was. Then Archie gently lowered his son to the floor and said cheerfully, I brought you a whole suitcase of presents. Let's go and see. Anthony was experiencing strange feelings. His mood changed every minute. He wanted to jump with joy then jump on his bed, burrow under the blanket and cry, cry, cry. His father's appearance, so long awaited, was too sudden for him. The boy had not been prepared for such an abrupt change in his life. Archie opened the suitcase of gifts. First to appear was a ceramic pity bank in the shape of a teddy bear. Here you go, son, to put your savings in. But I don't have any savings. Well, that's fixable. Now you will? What do you want to save for? Anthony shrugged silently. Well, here you go. I've got plenty more presents for you. I hope you like it. Anthony took the piggy bank awkwardly. He wasn't interested in presents now. He was trying to get a better look at his father, at every feature of his face. The boy was distracted, and the piggy bank fell out of his hands, shards scattering across the floor. The tears that Anthony had been carefully holding back burst forth. Archie, what's going on here? Grandma came running. You're not very good with a child. 
Her eyes fell on the scattered splinters. Oh, I'll clean it up. Anthony, darling, is it really worth crying over? Of course not. Archie held his son, who stood with his hands over his face. Did you like the piggy bank? Don't worry, we'll buy another one. No, even better. Boys, come to the table. My soup is ready, shouted Grandma. Come on, son. Archie clapped his hands. Oh, it's been a long time since I've had homemade soup. Don't you have anything to eat? Anthony stopped crying and looked at his father with great sympathy. I eat lunch in the cafeteria at work. If I'm a little late for lunch, the soup is usually already cold. You can't even imagine how disgusting cold soup is. And I don't like to cook. And I don't know how to cook. What can you do? Can you make a birdhouse? Can you teach me? Anthony's eyes lit up. A birdhouse? Sure. Just son, don't call me you, okay. Boys, how long are you waiting? It's getting cold. Grandma reminded me about dinner. Oh no, we can't let that happen. Let's go, son, smiled softly at his father. Anthony, when was the last time you were in town? Archie asked at lunch. I don't remember. The boy looked questioningly at his grandmother. Oh, it's been a long time since we've been there. What is there to do there in the city? We're fine here, she replied. It's a pity it's out of season. There's a good park in town, all sorts of merry-go-rounds. And what a Ferris wheel. Your mother and I used to ride there when we were young. Archie hesitated. What are you thinking of doing, Archie? I want to go into town with Anthony first, take a walk. You don't mind, do you, Julia? Oh, what are you asking me? Why don't you ask Anthony if he'll go with you or not? Well, I thought maybe you wouldn't want him to come with me. Yeah, how can I stop you? You're the father. Thank you. Archie got embarrassed for some reason and lowered his eyes to the table. Uncle, where will we go with you in the city? Anthony decided to clarify. There was an awkward pause. Archie blushed up to his ears and looked pleadingly at his former mother-in-law. Then only Anthony realized he'd said the wrong thing. Anthony, what kind of an uncle is he to you? Grandmother was horrified. He's your father, do you hear? You can't say uncle to him. Sorry, said the boy quietly and blushed too. It's okay, son, his father encouraged him. Thank you for the lunch, Julia. Archie stood up from the table. I never thought I'd have to eat soup like this someday. It's delicious. Oh, come on. The woman waved her hand. It's just soup. Everything is yours from the garden. Potatoes, carrots, onions, well. And the chicken is also yours. Well, go. The bus will be here soon. It won't wait for you. Papa, will you be here long? Anthony asked when they reached the city and stood at the streetcar stop. Alas, no, son. And you won't come again. There's our streetcar. I haven't been on a streetcar in a long time either. There aren't any in the town where I live. My father translated the conversation. Strange, thought the boy. He didn't answer anything. Probably, he just doesn't want to say. He decided, but kept silent. In general, in Anthony's opinion, there was a lot here that was still unclear. Daddy had arrived, but he wasn't quite daddy yet. He talked to Anthony too politely and attentively, holding his hand tightly, lifting him up on the footstool like a little boy and looking at him all the time, as if he were trying to memorize him. Is that how daddies act? Daddy, where do you live? Did mommy say up north? At this point, Archie noticed an elderly female passenger looking at them in surprise. Anthony, I'm your daddy and you're supposed to say you to me, not you he said in his son's ear. Sorry dad, replied the boy guiltily. I'm not used to it yet. I call you you because my mother and grandmother tell me to call all strangers that way. Now several passengers were scrutinizing them and Archie became embarrassed. Let's get off our stop, he said, and picking up his son, jumped out of the car. Waiting for another streetcar, the father said. Why did we get off this one? Archie was silent. Daddy, where are you taking me? Anthony began to whimper. Daddy, where are you taking me? Corrected his father patiently. We're going to the store to buy toys. But you brought me a whole bunch of toys, and we haven't even had time to look at them. Anthony said the word you in a volley. Archie was silent again. I get it, Anthony said sullenly. You're going to leave soon and never come back. I'll be gone in four days, Archie said thoughtfully, staring off into the distance. I've only got a week off from work. I live very far away. I came here by plane. You're not coming back, are you? Son, you know, 
We need to talk to your mom first, and then it will be clear. If things don't work out between us, I'll come to see you once a year. You don't mind if I come to see you, do you? Archie squatted down in front of his son. Anthony looked intently into his father's eyes. Come over, dad. At that moment, Anthony thought that even though he was not used to his father yet, but still his own father was much better. Last year, Anthony had learned that Uncle Harvey was Mama's fiancé. Not quite a fiancé, for everyone in the village said that Mama had not made up her mind yet and that he had little hope. Uncle Harvey had only been to their house twice. Both times, trying to win Anthony's favor, he had coddled him like a little boy. Anthony was disgusted, but several times he heard his grandmother say, Angelica, what are you thinking about? You don't procrastinate. Harvey is a good man. You need a man in the house. A husband for you. Anthony's a father. What do you want to buy for yourself? Anthony's father asked him at the baby store. I don't want anything, shrugged the boy. Well, don't be shy. Do you want to buy a gun? Anthony scrutinized the tin cannon. What does it shoot? It shoots cannonballs. No, daddy, no cannon. That's for little kids. I'd rather have that saber over there. Anthony sighed heavily and pushed the cannon aside with a serious look. You still need a piggy bank. Here, take a look at this one. You like it? It was better. The one I broke, Anthony sighed annoyed, his eyes filled with tears of resentment at himself. Come on, son. You're a man. Men don't cry, Anthony picked up. I know, that's what Uncle Billy says. Uncle Billy? Who's that? Archie's face changed. Uncle Billy is Harry's dad and Harry's my best friend. We bought a saber, a ball felt tip pens, coloring books, a piggy bank. Then dad took Anthony to another store and bought a new school uniform. Events followed one after another. The grocery store was next where they bought soda, chocolate, candy cookies. Tired son? Anthony waved his head affirmatively. Let's go to one more store, the last one. Let's get some perfume for mom, okay? Archie glanced at his watch. They'd make the bus. There was still time. Mom loves perfume. Only she doesn't buy it because she doesn't have any money, Anthony sighed. I know my mom likes perfume, Archie said thoughtfully, and I even remember what kind. You gave your mother perfume, didn't you? Anthony asked, but Archie didn't hear his question. He was immersed in his memories. The boy was already bold enough to call his father Papa to say you and if his father took him by the arm or shoulder and drew him to him. Anthony no longer resisted, and when they rode the streetcar across a high, long bridge, under which ran a quiet river, Anthony was so gazing that he did not notice how he grabbed his father's strong hand and did not let it go for a long time. Anthony was pleased with his father. He liked the way his father took his time and went with him wherever Anthony wanted to go, the way he talked to him seriously. Talking to him as if he were an adult and his equal, not obnoxiously coddling him like a baby. True, Archie once yelled at Anthony when he ran out of the sidewalk onto the road and almost got hit by a car. Anthony did not resent his father at all, realizing that he had yelled for the cause. The first store Archie and Anthony went to didn't have Angelica's favorite perfume. We have a little more time, said his father. Let's run. We have to make it. There should be another store nearby. They went out of the store into the street, the wet snow had changed to rain, and puddles had formed on the sidewalk. Archie took his son's hand and they ran down the wet sidewalk, laughing. Anthony hadn't had so much fun in a long time. His father, who just a few hours ago had been a complete stranger to the boy, was beginning to become dear and close. Girl, is there a Kathy Ritchie, such, with a dove? Asked Archie, running up to the counter with perfume. You're in luck. They just came in today just a small batch. Anthony took the box and pulled out a bottle. You dad, they smell bad. Are you sure it's mom's favorite perfume? I'm sure, son. Archie remembered giving it to Angelica with the first paycheck he got after returning from the army. Angelique had adored the scent, exquisitely spicy and fresh. A month later, what happened happened. They broke up. Angelique hastily packed her things and left the perfume behind. Archie often took this bottle and inhaled the fragrance. It was a scent he strongly associated with Angelique. Man, will you take the perfume? The melodious voice of the saleswoman brought Archie out of his memories. Hey, yes, of course I am. It's a fine choice. 
your wife will be pleased. Wife. Dad, are you tired? Why are you so sad? Anthony was rubbing his arm. It's all right, answered his father, paying for the perfume. Now, son, we have to run or we'll miss the last bus. My mom's probably home from work by now. The rain stopped. Archie glanced at his watch as he and Anthony, jumping through puddles, reached the station. Five minutes until the bus left. Well, son, you're a hero. We made it. Tired. Be patient. You'll be home soon. Dad, are you staying with us? I don't know, son. Stay, please. Our bus isn't here. It should be boarding by now. It must be delayed. Let's go to the information desk and find out. Father and son went into the station building. It wasn't crowded. Hello. Can you tell me why there's no bus to Cosmino? Archie politely addressed the dispatcher. Hello. He doesn't have a bus. Your bus left 40 minutes ago, right on schedule. Left how? It's supposed to leave right now. He's got an 8 o'clock p.m. departure. That's right. Honey, look at the clock. There's a board over there. 1840. Archie looked at his watch, and it was stopped. At this time, the Walker house was in an uproar. Realizing that Archie and Anthony had not returned from the city on the last bus, Angelica was rushing from corner to corner. Her grandmother drank medicine. Mom, how could you give him the baby? Angelica screamed. Oh, daughter, what have I done? Sobbed the old woman. I did not even think of the bad. Father is his own. Mom, don't you understand? He stole my son. Angelica dosed herself with Valerian. He'll take him to the north. We won't see Pasha again. Oh, Grandma splashed her hands. Yes, why are we sitting here? I'll run to Austin. He's the only one who has a car in the village. We have to go to town, to the police. Yes, yes, there's no time to lose. It turned out that Austin had taken a lot on his chest and not only could not drive, he couldn't stand on his feet. Anthony and Archie were already in a cab home. The boy sat down on his father's lap and trustingly laid his head on his broad chest and fell sweetly asleep. Archie looked out the window. The trees flashed quickly before his eyes. It seemed as if his whole life was passing before him. How would Angelica greet him? Had she forgiven him? Did she forgive him? Did she have a chance to start again? These questions kept Archie in suspense, and the closer they got to the village, the more excited he became. And Anthony was asleep. He was dreaming of summer and a small pond near their village. He, his mother and father, having laid out simple food, sat on the bank. A cab pulled up to the house. Archie paid the driver and carefully got out of the car, holding Anthony asleep in his arms. The driver carried the two shopping bags to the gate. Angelica, look, there's a car pulling up to the house, her mother shouted. Angelica ran out of the house in her robe and slippers. Oh, he rascal, you wanted to steal my son, she shouted when she saw Archie. Hush, hush, don't scream. Anthony's asleep. We were just taking a walk. By the way, that's my son too. Give me the baby, Angelica started ripping Anthony out of Archie's arms. Yeah, what are you doing? He's asleep. But Anthony was already awake and frightened by the scuffle. Mama, he held out his arms to her. My son, did that man hurt you? Mom, don't swear at him. My daddy is very good. We went out with him. I had so much fun. Here, I bought something for Anthony. Archie held it out. Get out of here so I don't see you again. We don't need anything from you. We've done it ourselves and we'll do it again. Angelica, we need to talk. Not in front of the baby. I've got nothing to talk to you about, Archie. Go away. Mommy, did Daddy buy you some perfume? Anthony's starting to whimper. We don't need anything, son. Let's go inside. Angelica took Anthony's hand and led him into the house. Anthony cried. This is not how he imagined the meeting of Mom and Dad. Now I'll take out your suitcase, which we have in the house, said Angelica, turning to Archie. There are presents for Anthony in the suitcase. We haven't had time to sort them out. We don't need them, I told you. Angelica, you're wrong. You are not right at all. Archie came close to his ex-wife and spoke very quietly, so as not to hear Anthony, who was standing on the porch. How could you take my son away from me? Why did you tell me? Okay, I know how guilty I am to you. I admit that you can't forgive me, but the baby is innocent. He's my son. I have a right to talk to him. Julia came out of the house. 
Okay, young people, she said sternly. Me and my grandson are going to visit a friend of mine, and you go in the house, you need to talk. Mom, why are you doing this? We have nothing to talk about. You'll thank me later, her mother whispered in Angelica's ear. Archie, why are you up? Come on in. Julia and Anthony left. Angelica and Archie sat in the kitchen and were silent for a long time, not knowing where to start talking. Archie had wanted to say so many things to Angelica on the way here, but all the words were gone now. Left alone with her, he felt stiff, like a teenager. I brought you perfume, your favorite perfume, I remember. Archie finally began to speak. Angelica turned away to the window and furtively brushed away a tear, a storm of feelings raging inside her. The ex-spouses didn't talk for long. To be exact, only Archie spoke, and Angelica remained thoughtfully silent the whole time. Would you mind if I took Anthony to the circus tomorrow? I promised him, Archie asked, saying goodbye. Take him, Angelica replied briefly. Only the show's in the evening. We'll take a cab back, so don't lose us, okay? I'm sorry about today. Okay, I'll go. The man turned around. Archie. Angelica called him so shrilly that Archie flinched. Where will you sleep tonight? She asked quietly. At Barry's, I went to see him as soon as I got there. At evening tea, Anthony told his mother and grandmother about where he and his father had been. It was not until late at night, when he climbed with his body on the big snow white pillow and wrapped his arms around it, that he began to sleep uneasily. In his half-sleep, he was still mumbling some words. Then in a sluggish, driving voice, he asked, Daddy, what soccer team do you root for? And then he fell asleep. At school, before the first lesson, Anthony told his classmates without a word that he now had a father, and he came to him on an airplane. Don't lie, Victor Pastakov said with envy. Everyone knows that you don't have a daddy, but your mom has a fiancé, Uncle Harvey from Kausakaka. I'm an honorary octogenarian, Anthony said proudly. See my new uniform. My dad bought it for me, and a whole bunch of presents. And yesterday, we bought presents in the city. It's a new uniform, said Betty. That one was a bit shabby. So what? Victor didn't stop. He was a very jealous boy. It doesn't mean anything. His mother could have bought him a uniform. He's lying. I'm not lying. I'm going to the circus with my dad today. And we're taking a cab home. We took the cab home yesterday, too. That's great. You drove fast, did you? I don't know. Anthony shrugged. I fell asleep almost immediately. Liar, Victor shouted. And I believe him. I don't believe you took the cab. My friend never lies. Such arguments broke out in the class that the students didn't even notice the teacher entering. After class, the doubts of the classmates were dispelled. Archie came to meet his son from school. Anthony shone with happiness. Let everyone see what kind of father he had. That evening, Anthony had been to the circus for the first time and even had his picture taken with a monkey and a bow constrictor. So now his classmates would not dare to doubt anything. Emotions were running high. His father became more and more dear to Anthony. It seemed that his father had always been with him since his birth and he did not want to believe that the day after tomorrow he would leave. On the way back, when Anthony and his father returned from the city by cab, Anthony felt sleepy, but he did not let himself fall asleep. He wanted to spend as much time as possible with his father, every extra minute father and son chatted about everything. Dad, tell me, how is it up there in the north? That's when things got really interesting. The father transformed in a second and with a twinkle in his eye began to tell how he rode reindeer, how he built a processing plant, how once he had a chance to sleep in a sleeping bag in the snow. Anthony was also surprised to learn that he and his father supported the same soccer team. Daddy, can you take me up north with you? Son, I'd really like to but I'm not sure I can. I live alone. I work all day. I can make an omelet. I can even make pasta. My grandmother taught me. You'll come home from work and dinner will be ready. What a good boy you are, Archie smiled wryly. I wish I could. I really, really wish I could, but you have to study. I'll talk to mama and get her to let you stay with me for the summer vacation. Oh, summer vacation. It's still a long way off. Anthony was upset. I'm sorry, son but I don't think it's going to be sooner than that. As the cab pulled up in front of the house, Archie and Anthony got out of the car. Well, run along, son. 
your mother and grandmother are probably waiting for you for dinner. Daddy, aren't you coming over? No, son, I'll go. Anthony was desperately pulling on his father's arm. You know what they say, Archie tried to smile. You don't go in uninvited. What do you mean, uninvited? I'm inviting you. I'm afraid mother won't be very pleased. Dad, you're leaving the day after tomorrow. Well, all right, just for a little while. When Archie entered the house and met Angelica's gaze, he thought he saw a slight smile slip from the corner of her lips. At any rate, Angelica was more welcoming than she had been yesterday. Oh, Archie, the ex-mother-in-law was making a fuss. I'll warm up dinner for you and Anthony. Thank you, Julia. I'm not hungry, Archie said, and looked questioningly at Angelica. Come to the table, she said dryly and went to her room. Of course, Angelica couldn't sleep a wink last night. She had so much to think about, remember and relive. Meanwhile, Anthony was telling his grandmother about his impressions from the trip. And there were a lot of impressions and all of them were positive. Anthony told her so loudly and emotionally that Angelica could clearly hear every word he said behind the closed door. And again she thought, thought, no papa, don't go. Let's play a little. She heard her son's pitiful voice and realized that Archie was going to leave after all. Angelica left the room. Angelica, I'll come back tomorrow, okay? We need to talk, to decide. Come, Angelica said quietly. Saturday afternoon. Archie arrived at noon. Julia saw him and went straight to her friend's house. She realized that the conversation would be serious, one might say decisive. Anthony, she called her grandson go outside and play with Valka. He's been here recently. Anthony, taking with him a saber given by his father, went outside. The children came. Anthony proudly showed the gift and told them about yesterday's trip to the circus. Suddenly, Anthony became alert and stopped talking. Uncle Harvey was walking down the street with wide steps. Hello, Anthony. He smiled sweetly. Is mom home? Anthony was tempted to say no, but he had been taught that it was wrong to cheat. So, stammering, he answered, hi, at home. But it wasn't until Uncle Harvey made a move that Anthony caught. Anthony's mind jumped with feverish thoughts. The cheerfulness which he had a moment ago displayed triumphantly before Uncle Harvey was gone at once, and anxiety and an unpleasant heavy feeling crept into the little heart. Whoa, Harry jumped up and down. Well, now your daddy's going to give him a kicking. Anthony wanted to run home, but did not dare. He moved a little farther away and watched the house, losing patience. Finally, the door swung open. Anthony joyfully imagined that Uncle Harvey would come out of it with his head down, but out came his father. He walked down the street very fast, almost at a run, and Anthony could hardly catch up with him on the next street. Daddy, where are you going? He clung to his hand, tears in his voice. I'll be right back, son. Can I come with you? Come on. Father and Anthony walked briskly down the middle of the street. They walked in silence like two like-minded people, taking no notice of the passers-by, and each was preoccupied with his own thoughts. Anthony's anxiety had not yet passed, but he was glad to be walking with his father. Though he had long wanted to ask where they were going, he asked nothing. It seemed that now it was necessary to be silent. They came to the house of a fellow villager where his father was staying. Anthony stayed in the yard playing with the dog. From time to time, he looked out of the window and saw his father and Uncle Barry discussing something. Finally, his father came out of the house. Don't you think it's time to go home, son? It's time, it's time, shouted the happy Anthony. Soon they were walking into the house. Angelica was already alone. Her face was serious, but her eyes were definitely laughing. Such things never escaped Anthony, and he too was filled with delight. Angelica? I've gone out, father said, to let you two talk. You did the right thing, Archie. Mother seemed not to notice Anthony and only had eyes for father. I can relay to you our entire conversation and it was most definitely the last. Harvey won't be here again. Please don't, begged father pleadingly. Mom raised her head high and walked slowly toward him. Anthony, covering his mouth with his hand to keep from screaming with joy, slipped out into the yard. Archie returned three months later having settled things at work and sold his north apartment. After moving north, Archie first worked as a laborer at a factory construction site and then learned to become a fine auto mechanic. Together with a fellow villager, Barry, 
he decided to open a cooperative auto repair shop in the nearest district center. Archie and Angelica were married in the summer. I told you we have another wedding, Archie laughed. Anthony was happy, probably happier than the newlyweds themselves, and now he was proud to bear his father's name. On September 2nd, Anthony, overflowing with joy, brought a birdhouse to school, the one he had failed to make the previous year, and it still haunted him to this day. They made the birdhouse together with his father and then painted it with paints with his mother. How beautiful, the teacher was surprised. Guys, do you know where our friend Polk and the dog has gone? He hasn't been here since last night. My dad let me take him home. Anthony was shining with happiness. Polkin lives with us now. That's wonderful news, boys. I'm very happy that our all-time favorite has found a home. I'll come over and play with Polkin, said Harry's friend. Good. And also, Anthony went to a whisper, but don't tell anyone. He put his finger to his lips. I heard mom and dad talking. I'm going to have a brother or sister soon. Better a brother, of course. Julia called a cab and hurriedly got into the car. She told the driver where to take her. As soon as the driver dropped her off at her destination, the 40-year-old woman paid and quickly left the car. In her thoughts was beating only one thought that now all the pain in her soul will soon end and she will finally find peace. Julia quickly approached the coveted bridge, the sound of her heels resounding loudly in the silence. It was four in the morning and there were no people at all. The woman had chosen this particular bridge on purpose, as it was always a little crowded, and so she was sure that no one would interfere with her plans. Julia quickly crossed half of the bridge and stopped. She looked over the railing into the water and breathed a sigh of relief, because now everything would end here. The woman climbed over the railing and looked up at the sky as she suddenly heard a man's voice speaking softly. A foolish decision. There are many other ways to end your life. The woman flinched at being addressed and turned her head toward the speaker. She saw a man about her age standing across the street by another railing. Julia wondered how this stranger was here, for she had not seen him when she came here. The woman said in reply, Where did you come from? You weren't here. How could you notice me if you were so busy thinking about jumping into the river? And it's not hard to guess why you wanted to do it. I'll say it again. It's stupid to jump off a bridge. If you guessed, then now you decided to play Jack from the movie Titanic and save Rose by talking. Julia said irritably, you called the movie cool, but I'm afraid that I do not have the eloquence of DiCaprio and cannot beautifully describe how cold the water at this time of year, still before the beach season is still far away. But I can say something else, that you are thinking only about yourself now. Perhaps you have reasons for this act that you want to do and probably you think that it will be easier for you. Now think about your loved ones. What will it be like for them? Surely, you have relatives who could not recognize what you have in your soul, could not help you. And they will consider your departure from life as their fault, because they were not able to lend a helping hand when you needed it. And your relatives will blame themselves for it for the rest of their lives, said the stranger in a calm voice. Are you a psychologist? said the woman, suddenly feeling tears come to her eyes. No, I work as a lawyer. So what's next? Are we going to talk while you're standing behind the railing? Can I come over here and help you back up? See, I even ask permission and I don't rush in without your permission. And I can even tell you why. If I try to approach you now, you'll involuntarily do what you're up to and I won't have time to do anything about it. The choice is yours. Julia was confused by the situation and didn't know what to do. She hadn't expected to notice a man on the bridge who would turn to her. Meanwhile, the man stood watching the woman, waiting for her to make a decision and what kind of decision she would make. Julia clumsily began to climb over the railing, and the stranger, noticing it, hurried to help her. The woman looked at him gratefully and said nothing. As soon as Julia was on the other side of the railing, the interlocutor extended his hand and greeted her. My name is Steve. And then the stranger suggested a conversation in a more appropriate setting. And Julia at the same moment became wary and said, Or maybe you're a scoundrel, and you have other purposes in mind, to get acquainted. What are you doing here at this early hour? I see you're coming to your senses, the man said with a laugh and then continued seriously. I'm not a rapist. I am here for one reason and I do it once a year and on this day. This is a strange conversation we're having. 
I feel awkward. But maybe you can tell me what you're doing alone on this bridge at four in the morning, Julia said. I have a car parked nearby. So let's go there. It's freezing outside. And I'll tell you what I'm doing here. Steve said it so simply that Julia simply believed the man. The woman nodded in agreement and they walked to the man's car. Once inside the car, Steve quietly said that he had an exciting moment of memory with the bridge. The woman looked at the man with interest and asked if she could find out about it. The man looked at Julia thoughtfully and said that he was willing to tell her about himself if he could hear her story of why she wanted to end her life. Julia thought for a while and then agreed and the man began to speak. I had a girlfriend I loved, whose name was Maria. We met by chance. I wandered into the exhibition of young artists in the gallery and saw her. I'll tell you right away that I'm not at all familiar with art and my visit was in this place only for the sake of brightening up my leisure time. And then I saw Maria, fell in love at first sight, but I did not know how to meet the girl. She noticed, apparently, my dumbfounded look at her, because the first came up to me and asked why I so look at her, and I as a sheep could not say anything in response. And she laughed. Maria immediately realized that I was not indifferent to her, so she offered to meet me. I was grateful to her for this, because I could not have offered it myself. We had a date, and then a second date. At that time I was working as an investigator and I was 26 years old, and she was 24 years old. Anyway, we started dating, but it was innocent dating. We didn't even kiss, let alone do anything else. And then about a month after we met, we ended up here on the bridge. It was on this very day, which is now, and I unexpectedly proposed to her, and she smiling happily agreed, and then I kissed her for the first time. With these words, the man paused and looked out the car window. Julia listened to the story with bated breath. She completely forgot about herself as she saw that the man as if he was reliving his past all over again. The woman waited for the continuation of the story, but the interlocutor was silent, and then she quietly coughed and reminded herself. Steve involuntarily shuddered and looked at the new acquaintance, and then more quietly continued the story. Soon we were married. A year later we had twins. There were two adorable girls we named Veronica Cindy. Maria and I were still planning at the time that we still wanted a daughter who we would name Katie. Just imagine we would have three girls named Veronica, Cindy, Katie, and again Steve fell silent. Julia waited impatiently for him to continue as she saw him involuntarily brush away a tear with the back of his hand. Julia touched the man's arm and suggested changing the subject. She didn't know why she did it, but Steve smiled and said that he would bring his story to the end. And he continued speaking. Our dream was not destined to come true. Our girls were already five years old. Maria went to work when our daughters were three and we put them in kindergarten. At that time, I was investigating a too serious case, which involved officials who had not the last place in our city. In general, when we took one criminal, I was offered to make sure that this criminal did not get time. I refused. It was not in my principles to help the bandit to remain unpunished. And then the irreparable happened. I was threatened but I didn't believe that in this day and age they could do anything to me. And again, Steve paused. He took a long time to gather the strength to speak and soon began to speak again. That afternoon, my spouse said she was going to drive our car to visit her mother and her children. She does this once a month and I didn't suspect anything and so I agreed and, as was always the case, left the car with her that day. She had power of attorney to drive. And just a couple hours later, as I was at work, I got a call that my car had been blown up. I couldn't believe what I heard and really hoped that my spouse and children weren't there. However, it was when Maria got into the car and started the engine that the explosion occurred, and I lost a loved one in two swallows, my daughters, overnight. At that moment, I thought I was going to go crazy, but in me lived the revenge of reprisal. Only this feeling helped me to cope with grief. I made every effort to lock up and not to release this bandit because of whom I lost my family. But then I had to find the scumbag who blackmailed me and on his unspoken order Maria and my daughters were gone. And only after a year and a bit I was able to put away that scoundrel who gave the order that my family was gone and then the perpetrator of this act was also found. I can't say that I felt any better after that 
as I sometimes felt that I should have gone ahead and let that scumbag go and my wife would still be alive with my daughters. I often indulge in these thoughts, but I know that if I had gone against the law Maria would not have approved of it, but that makes me feel a little better. So I've told you my story. I hope you now understand my visits to this bridge. I'm drawn here by memories of Maria. Here I relive again and again those exciting moments when I was happy with the woman I loved. Honestly, I didn't even expect myself to open up to a complete stranger, but I don't regret it at all. Maybe I needed an outside listener too, but I don't know why. Now it's your turn to confide in me. It's much better when you tell your life to someone outside of yourself. The man said and looked at the woman who was sitting silently. Steve wanted to add something else, but immediately changed his mind. He got out of the car for a few minutes, looked at the sky, and then returned to the car and turned to his new acquaintance. My story has been told, now it's your turn. I can't force you to talk and now it's your choice again, whether to trust me or not. You know, after what you told me, I'm shocked. You had such a tragedy in your life and you did not give up. And I almost smile of a shoe, I see But you know what I'm talking about. But answer me this question. Why do you want to know about me? I don't even know how to answer that. Let's just say that if I hadn't been there on the bridge, you would have realized your intention. And now I feel like I'm responsible for your fate. And to be honest, I really wonder what event in your life made you decide to leave your life of your own free will. My life in two words cannot tell in two words replied quietly interlocutor. At that moment, the man laughed softly. Julia looked at Steve with surprise. She did not understand what was so funny. The man, seeing the perplexity of the passenger, immediately apologized and said, I have a day off today and I'm in no hurry. And it seems to me that before that you didn't care about the time in connection with your idea to jump from the bridge, and now you suddenly remembered about the time. Julia initially wanted to take offense at this remark, but she immediately put herself off because he was actually telling the truth. The woman smiled sadly and said that she was ready to tell her story. The man nodded in response and motioned for her to begin. Julia squeezed her temples with her palms and then lowered her hands, clasped them together and began her story. Julia was born in the village and there was only one other child in the family, her younger sister Leslie. When Julia was 17 years old, her father died of a heart attack. The girl's mother Betty was very worried about the death of her husband as she was happy with her spouse. Julia already a month after the funeral of her father realized that without her father's salary now they will have a hard time. She saw that her mother tried to give her and her sister a tidbit. Julia decided that as soon as she finished 11 grades, she will go to the city to enter the seamstress and try to get a job in addition to studying and help her mother financially. And the girl realized her dream. She actually after graduating from high school went to college, settled in a dormitory for non-residents, and found a job in the evening washing floors in a grocery store. When Julia received her first paycheck, she immediately transferred most of it to her mother. Betty scolded her daughter for this and asked her not to transfer any more money to her mother, but to spend it on herself. Julia responded by saying to her mom, I know how hard it is for you financially now. It is necessary that Tanya was not worse dressed than others. You know that she is now at such an age when you want to show off the new clothes. Daughter, I understand everything, but you have to work and study, and it's very difficult, and you need money yourself, I can't help you much. Don't worry about me, I still get a scholarship. You better take care of yourself and ask Leslie what she wants for her 15th birthday. As soon as you find out, call me and let me know, replied her daughter. It's been six months since Julia went to college and now she's on her way home for winter break. She is bringing her mother a cosmetic kit as a gift and her sister a fashionable pair of jeans. The girl anticipates how she will please her relatives. However, when she arrives home, she finds out that her mother is in the hospital. Julia scolded her sister for not informing her about it and Leslie said in response, My mother asked me not to tell you anything. She did not want to worry you as she was worried that you would drop out of school and rush home. The next day, the sisters visited their mother at the district hospital. Julia affectionately reproached her mother for hiding the hospitalization from her. Betty, seeing her daughter scolding her, smiled back and said that her health was improving from that moment on. 
Julia kissed her mother tenderly and promised to visit her every other day. The winter vacation flew by quickly and Julia returned to her studies in the city. As she was walking, a man's voice called her name from behind. She turned around and saw an unfamiliar guy. The girl looked at him in surprise and said, Yes, I'm Julia, but I don't know you. Actually, I don't know you either. I was mistaken. I thought my former classmate was coming. It's funny that you have the same name as her. Let me walk you out since I already know your name. My name is Anthony. Thanks, but I don't need a chaperone. You're such a prick. I just want to see you off. I don't have any dark thoughts. And you cannot give your consent. I'll just go behind you. And you cannot forbid me to do that. Especially it is not forbidden by law, said the young man smiling. Julia involuntarily smiled at this phrase. At that moment, she did not know that this new acquaintance would become her husband in a few months. The relationship between the young people developed very quickly, and soon the guy made a marriage proposal to Julia, and then a modest wedding took place. Julia's husband was from this city, lived separately from his parents in a one-room apartment. He was 25 years old. He worked as a plumber in the housing and utilities. Anthony was fond of soccer and liked to chase on his motorcycle. After the wedding, the girl moved to live with her husband. She told the chosen one that she dreams of graduating from college as soon as possible and get a job to at least somehow help her mother financially. And the girl also told her husband that she has a cherished dream is to open a small atelier. The man laughed and said, your dream is quite expensive. You figure out how many finances are needed. It is necessary to buy professional equipment, rent a room and a lot of fiddles. That's okay. The main thing is to believe in your dream and want it, said in response to his wife. And a month after this conversation, Julia found out that she was pregnant. This news was a surprise for her. Her plan was to first get an education, open an atelier, and then think about children. The girl was at a loss and did not know whether she should be happy about the pregnancy or, on the contrary, upset. On the same day, Julia informed her husband that she was in an interesting position. In contrast to the wife, Anthony immediately exclaimed and began to sprinkle kisses on his wife. The young man rejoiced at the news and said to his wife, You are a clever girl. You have made me such a gift. You and I will become parents. It is such a happiness. Julia, as she saw the reaction of her spouse, she realized that there was no doubt that this baby would be born. And only after that she realized that in fact in their family there is a lack of a child. The girl decided that training would wait for a while, as well as the opening of the atelier. Julia notified her mother about this news, as well as her mother-in-law. Relatives warmly congratulated the young woman and asked her to take care of herself. Julia assured that she will definitely monitor the state of her health. The girl quit her job at the insistence of her husband. She did not want to do this, but Anthony was categorical. The husband said that he did not want to risk his wife's health when she carries a heavy bucket of water in the store. In due time, Julia gave birth to a healthy baby girl, which the young parents called the beautiful name Ariana. From the maternity hospital, the woman and her infant were greeted by Anthony and his mother. The man carefully accepted the small package from the hands of the nurse and looked at the tiny face of the baby softly said, Our Ariana is like an angel. Time moved slowly forward and soon the girl was one year old. Julia thought about going back to college. The young woman really wanted to realize her cherished desire and in the future to open an atelier. In this regard, she started a conversation with her husband. I want to continue my studies. Very interesting. But what about our little girl? She is still a baby who will babysit her? I thought I'd talk to my mom about it, that she's only working, even though she's just retired. Let her rest a little and sit with Ariana for six months. The more we will see her more often, and she will live with your mom. And as soon as she's a year and a half old, she can go to nursery school. You've got it all figured out. I don't even know what to say. In general, we did not even ask their mothers and whether they agreed to this, thoughtfully said the husband. I'll talk to my mom and your mom myself. The main thing is that you do not mind, and I have one more favor to ask of you. Please stop frolicking on a motorcycle like a boy. Do not forget that you are already the head of the family and racing on the highway like a teenager. Yeah, I don't do that very often, 
Well, I, I promise that I will be even less likely to skip this iron horse, with a smile said the man and kissed his wife on the lips. Julia soon talked to her mother, who at first refused her daughter's proposal, saying that she would lose her job, and therefore the additional income. But Julia convinced Betty that this way she would see more often with her granddaughter and with her children. Leslie at that time was already in college in the same city where Julia lived. This last argument was decisive and the older woman agreed. A month later, Betty arrived and moved in with Anthony's mother. Julia had recovered in college and after studying she would go straight to her mother-in-law's house to see her daughter. And when meeting Ariana told the little girl that she missed her very much and loved her madly. Six months flew by and the girl turned one and a half years old. Julia wanted her mother to still hang out with her granddaughter at least until she was two years old, but Betty told her daughter, I cannot live in the city, I feel trapped in four walls, I want to go home, I miss the country air, why don't I take Ariana to my place in the village and you can come on vacation? No mom, that's out of the question. It's one thing not to see my daughter for a day, but it's another when I don't see her for months, but I won't talk you into it, I know you're homesick for your garden and the country but don't leave until I put Ariana in a nursery. I would ask my mother-in-law to take care of my daughter, but she's working, Julia said. Soon the young woman had Ariana in the nursery, and after that, Biggie went home. Julia saw her mother off at the train station and asked her not to work too hard in the vegetable garden and to take care of herself. The old woman replied that her daughter had grown up to be a good person. Six months flew by unnoticed, and Julia hurried to pick up her daughter after college. The young woman, as always, began to ask Ariana how she had spent the day, and the child was still not quite coherently trying to tell her mother what they were doing in the group. Julia came home with her daughter and found her husband not at home. The young woman furrowed her eyebrows as she realized where her spouse might be missing, namely, running around the track on his motorcycle again. Julia had argued with him several times before, but Anthony only promised that he would stop racing, but in fact continued to ride. The time was nearing 9 o'clock in the evening and Julia was getting nervous. She dialed her husband, but he was out of range. The woman called her mother-in-law and asked if her son had arrived before her. Anthony's mother reported that he had not. Soon the clock struck midnight and Anthony was still gone. Julia could not find a place from anxiety and dialed her spouse several times in succession, but the subscriber was still not online. The young woman only dozed off in the morning when she was immediately awakened by the phone call. She happily grabbed the receiver, thinking to herself that it was her husband, but when she saw the number, she realized it wasn't him. Julia picked up the phone and heard an unfamiliar male voice saying her surname, first name, and middle name in a questioning tone. The woman replies that it's her and perplexedly says, What do you want? You need to come to the morgue for identification, said the caller and then gave the address where to come. Julia was at a loss at first. She could not believe what she had heard and asked the caller again if he had gotten the number wrong. However, the man repeated the information one more time and then disconnected the connection. The young woman sat down on the floor in exhaustion. She wanted to scream with horror but she couldn't. He didn't even have tears at that moment. Julia called her mother-in-law and said in a lifeless voice that she had just been informed. A short time later, Julia, accompanied by Anthony's mother, was at the morgue. The first to look at the body was an elderly woman who screamed out her son's name. After this, Julia looked and at once the light before her eyes faded. She came to on a couch in the corridor of the morgue. A man in a white coat stood over her and gave her a sniff of a pungent-smelling absorbent cotton. As Julia woke up, the medic said, You've lost consciousness. How do you feel now? And after these words took a glass with liquid from the nightstand, which he handed to the woman saying, Drink this sedative. You need it now. Julia instantly realized where she was and what grief had happened in her family. She did not sob but simply covered her face with her hands and froze in that position. She could hear her mother-in-law wailing in the distance about the loss of her son. Julia remained in that position for a few minutes, and then she took her hands off her face and asked the paramedic to give her another look at her husband. The man nodded silently and invited with a gesture. 
Julia walked over to the body and stroked her lover's cheek. She didn't scream, didn't sob. Tears just streamed down her face continuously. The woman stood like that for a few minutes and then went out into the hallway. Here a man in uniform approached her and told her how Anthony had crashed. Julia listened to the man in silence and asked permission to leave. He said yes and Julia went to her mother-in-law's house. The women embraced. Then the funeral was held where many people were present. Many good words were said for Anthony. Julia did not shed a single tear during the burial. She was as if petrified from the inside. It seemed to her that a part of her was buried together with her husband. The young woman, when the coffin was already buried, realized that now she would never again be able to hug the man she loved and say how much she loved him. After Anthony's funeral was a couple of months, all this time Julia often visited the grave, bringing artificial flowers. She would sit near the grave for long periods of time and mentally talk to her deceased husband. She would tell how she spent the day and how their daughter was growing up. Time slowly moved forward and now Ariana was two and a half years old. Suddenly Julia received a call from her mother's neighbor informing her that Betsy had been taken to the hospital. The young woman was terrified that she might lose her mother as well. She immediately called her sister back and only wanted to tell her that her mother had been hospitalized and she was going to leave today or at least tomorrow as Leslie said. I already know about everything. My mother's neighbor told me a few minutes ago. I can't go at the moment as I have studies. I have school too, and what of it? Julia said perplexed. Why don't you go and find out? If it's serious, I'll come right away. I really can't get out of school. We have a very strict with it here. Just a little something and expel. Almost not crying, said Leslie. Okay, okay. Just be always in touch, said her sister, who was surprised by Tanya's behavior. Julia immediately called the college and explained her situation and asked to give her a few days to go to the village. There was no refusal. The young woman then went to the train station to buy a train ticket. Much to her disappointment, she was only able to buy a ticket for the top shelf as there were no other seats available. So Julia and her daughter entered the train car. She found her seat and sat down, waiting for fellow travelers to try to exchange shelves. Soon came a man who had the top shelf and then came a middle-aged woman with a child, who looked to be about five years old, who had bought two lower seats for herself and her son. Julia asked the woman to give up the lower seat, but she was rudely refused. Julia said perplexed, I don't understand why you are so adamant. Your boy is five years old, and he can sleep on the bottom shelf on his own, and you are mine on the top shelf. Just imagine how I will sleep with my little daughter upstairs. You should have bought tickets in advance and not to save money, but to take a separate seat for the child, like I did. I have an unplanned trip. My mom was hospitalized, so I had to take a ticket for the next train. I don't care about your problems, and don't talk to me about it anymore, the woman said sharply and began to settle down defiantly. Julia only wanted to tell her companion that she was being dishonest, but then she was approached by a guy from a neighboring compartment who offered her a lower seat. Julia thanked the young man and then saw that he was an invalid. The guy had no arm up to his elbow. The girl resolutely refused the offer, but the neighbor in the compartment pronounced, You do not look that I am disabled. I can easily get on the second shelf, but you and your child will obviously not be comfortable there, and there's no sense to persuade this lady. So please don't refuse. Don't make me feel inferior. Thank you very much. I did not want to offend you just... Not finishing the phrase, the girl was embarrassed. No need to thank me. Let's throw your things, and I'll take your place, said the young man with a smile. Julia, in response, thanked the guy once again, and mentally thought, what a noble young man this young man is, and then took her bag and daughter and went to the next compartment, throwing a scornful look at the woman who did not give way. Soon Julia visited her mother in the hospital. The girl looked at her mother with a concerned look and immediately noted that her mother had given up a lot in the last month. Julia asked her mother how she was feeling, and she said that she was fine. The girl realized that her mother would not tell her anything, so she turned to the attending doctor and asked him to tell her about the patient's health. The doctor listened to the visitor's request and said, What can I tell you? Your mom needs to worry less and reduce physical activity. But she sits at home and does nothing. What other physical activity? 
Julia asked perplexed. Are you asking me? These children have gone, do not even know how their parents live. Your mother works, she picks potatoes at the base. And there you don't just pick potatoes, you have to carry sacks of potatoes, the man in the white coat said reproachfully. Julia felt ashamed after the doctor's words and returned to her mother's room. She sat down next to Betty and quietly said, Mammy, why are you doing this? Promise me that as soon as you are discharged, you will immediately quit working. I will never forgive myself if you undermine your health because you help us. Daughter, who else can help you but me? I know you need money and your dream needs money too. Yes, and Tanya needs help while she's studying. Mom, if you don't quit your job, then I'll drop out of college. So you decide how to do the right thing. Quietly but firmly said her daughter in response. And only when she saw that her mother nodded obediently in agreement, Julia turned the conversation to another topic. The young woman stayed in the village for a few days, and as soon as the doctor said that Betty was getting better, she informed her mother that she was leaving. Julia once again reminded her mother of her promise not to work again. And life went on again, and soon Julia graduated from college and got a job in a garment factory. The young woman tried to save on everything she could. She wanted to help her mother financially. And Betty, as soon as she received a transfer of money from her daughter, she immediately called and scolded Julia, she said. If you send me money, I'll go out to work. If you have an extra dime, save it for a rainy day. Life is unpredictable. I'm stretching myself, and I don't need much for an old woman, but you, as a young woman, need cosmetics and other things. And don't forget Ariana, she needs a doll and candy too. What rainy day? I don't send you money every month, but occasionally, so don't scold me, and I don't wear much makeup. And just try to go to work, I'll take offense at you. Julia said sternly in response. A few years passed. By this time Julia's sister had finished her studies and lived with her mother in the village, the girl worked as a pharmacist in a pharmacy. She had a young man who proposed to her and soon she married him. And then Leslie gave birth to twin girls. Julia, on the other hand, continued to work and was preparing to give her daughter to the first grade. The young woman herself sewed a uniform for Ariana and happily admired her girl. Julia was interested in how her daughter would study and what she wanted to become in the future. She asked her daughter about it often and heard different answers every time. Ariana said that she dreamed of becoming a singer, and a week later the girl dreamed of becoming a famous fashion model, and after another time she wanted to be the director of a toy store. All these answers amused Julia. She realized that her daughter was not ready to give a definite answer because of her age. A year passed and Ariana finished the first grade, and Julia together with her daughter went on vacation to the village. The young woman, as always went to her mother not empty-handed, she tried to always bring at least some gift to her mother. Julia did not forget about her sister with her husband and children. And as soon as Julia appeared at her mother's house, she learned that Leslie divorced her husband. This news shocked Julia and she began to ask her sister what was wrong with her husband. Leslie did not become cunning and frankly reported that the chosen one found a woman on the side and went to live with her. Julia sympathized with her sister and advised not to get upset about it. Leslie calmly replied, I'm not even worried. If my husband is a dog, then he and in Africa will be it. Let him go to all four sides. The main thing that the alimony will be good to pay, after all, works as an agronomist, and I'll always find a man for myself. My face is not ugly, my figure is chiseled. So sister, don't worry about me in this respect. You need to take care of yourself, otherwise you're all alone and alone. Yes, I had an admirer, we dated for about a month, but it didn't work out. We were always fighting over little things. We didn't torture each other and just broke up. And now I'm not even in a hurry to get acquainted, as I have plans to open my own business. My mother-in-law offered me help in the form of finance, so I don't have a lot of time for amorous affairs at the moment. Wow, so soon you'll be a lady with a rich dowry. Leslie asked with a laugh. Laugh, laugh, laugh. But I'm gonna give it a shot. I think it's going to work out, said her sister admonishingly. No offense, I'm just kidding. And where do you want to start your business? The amount of mother-in-law gives a small. So initially, I will go to Washington for goods and sell in his city for various organizations. 
Most likely it will be children's clothes, so I can dress Ariana and your children at the same time. And then, as soon as I increase the capital, I will start to buy equipment, and then already on the rise, that is, rent a room, hire staff, at least one more seamstress. Approximately this is my plan. I hope that in a year or a year and a half already open there at Lear, Julia replied and looked at her sister with a wait-and-see attitude, waiting for her reaction. Leslie only shrugged her shoulders in response. After the summer vacation, Julia and her daughter returned home and began to realize her dream. Initially quit her job, and then she took money from her mother-in-law, left Ariana at her place for a few days, and went to Washington herself. Julia bought a batch of baby clothes and came home, and then she began to go to businesses with the box. The young woman was very hopeful that she would sell the goods in a short time, but the trade was not going well. Julia was genuinely annoyed about it. It had already been a month after arriving from Washington, and the goods were not even realized and a third. The woman could not understand why she could not sell children's things. Her mother-in-law came to her rescue and said, you need to replenish the goods with a new assortment. Perhaps in this case will be sold and from the last arrival of children's things. But I can't help you financially. I already gave you what I had. You know it yourself. I would not have taken money from you. You have already helped me. Thank you so much for your advice. Julia wondered for a long time where she could get more money. She knew there was no point in going to her mother. Leslie lives with her two children and her income is her own salary and child support for her daughters. Julia long puzzled over where to take money and came to the conclusion that there is only one way out is to take a microloan for a month. The young woman took the loan the next day and went to Washington to pick up the goods. As soon as she came back, she again went to various organizations and businesses with her bags. But this time too, there was no trade. Julia was desperate. Two weeks had passed, and she still hadn't sold half of her goods. The woman realized that the loan would soon be due and she had no money to pay it off. Julia did not know what to do, how she could get out of this situation. She even went to her mother's village to sell at least some of her children's things, but there she was disappointed. Julia was at her mother's for a few days, and Betty saw that her daughter was depressed. The pensioner asked Julia, What's wrong with you? I can see you're not doing well. Mom, everything is fine. Just a little headache, Julia lied. Who are you trying to fool, my daughter? A mother's heart can't be tricked. Just tell it like it is, so I don't worry. Mommy, this trade is not working out for me. I'm about to pay the loan, and I don't have any money. I even missed last month's utility bills because of it. My hands are falling down because I don't know what to do. My head is spinning and I can't even imagine what to do. Calm down, on sweetheart. I have some savings, so-called coffins, I'll give them to you. And you know, it seems to me that your trade is not going because you do not have a salesman spirit, which can favorably offer the goods. I think you should quit selling baby stuff. You'll get into debt and then you won't be able to pay it off. Mommy, I can't take money from you. I'm ashamed that you'll worry about me now. I need to find my own way out of the situation, said her daughter with tears in her eyes. But don't cry. You yourself have a growing child, and how do you think, if your girl was in trouble, you would not help her, would you? You're not saying anything? Then I'll answer for you that I'd give my last pants to help my own child. So stop being stubborn and take the money and close this loan, and then go back to work, said Betty and stroked her daughter's head. Julia had no choice but to take money from her mom. When the young woman took the money, she promised her mother that she would pay it back in the nearest future. Beatty jokingly threatened her daughter with her index finger and sternly told Julia not to even think of returning the amount. Julia, as soon as she arrived home, she immediately repaid the loan. And then, while she still had a job to get some more money, she went back to the organizations and sold children's things for almost the same price as she had bought them. In this case, her trade went much better. She sold almost everything. However, this fact did not please her at all because Julia did not make any profit. Again, Julia took a job in a garment factory. The young woman kept thinking how she could start her own business. She realized that on the salary of a seamstress, she could not accumulate capital. And then Julia filed an ad in the newspaper that sews things to order. The woman was willing to work 15 hours a day just to open an atelier. 
The ad was responded to two weeks after its submission. Julia was approached by a pensioner and asked to shorten her coat. Julia had to refuse the customer because her machine was not designed for sewing thick materials. As soon as the disappointed pensioner left, the landlady burst into tears in despair because she was again in for a disaster. And when Julia had already given up hope that she could at least earn some money, she was called again and asked if she could make a New Year's costume for a 10-year-old girl. The young woman replied that she would be happy to take the job. And at the end of the conversation, she added that she would sew the costume in a couple of days. That day, Julia was as jubilant as a child because she had a part-time job. Now the woman dreamed of only one thing, to sew a New Year's costume perfectly because her reputation as a dressmaker depended on it. Julia actually sewed for a couple of days product, however. For this, she had to stay at work to sweep the seams on the overlock. At home, the woman did not have a special basting machine. But Julia was not embarrassed by this circumstance. The main thing is that the New Year's costume was some like a factory product. And soon the client with her daughter came for the order. The child tried on the outfit and smiled contentedly. And the guest took the suit and fastidiously turned on the inside to examine the seams and then said with surprise, You're a virtuoso at what you do. I thought it would be bushy and I was wrong. You did an excellent job. I'll recommend you to my friends. And now take the money for your labors. And with these words, I gave the landlady the money. Thank you very much for your appreciation of my work. I will be grateful if, let's say, make me an unspoken advertisement. I'll give you a discount next time. A few days later, Julia again called and asked to make a dressy skirt. The young woman invited the client to her place to take measurements and find out what style is necessary. Literally, in a couple of days, the product was ready and again the words of gratitude followed. Julia was over the moon with happiness because already the second order was sung by her. And then for about a month, the woman did not receive any calls. Julia was ready to give up again. But then the first customer called and said in a business-like manner, I have a proposition for you. I need aprons for my beauty salon on my sketch. Only eight pieces. I want the masters to be in a beautiful uniform, not like everyone else. Will you do it? Sure, let your masters come to me and I'll take their measurements. But let's talk about the time frame right away. All right, I'll wait. I almost forgot. You told me about the discount. Is it relevant or was it just a figure of speech? Why would you say that? I promised you that I will reduce the price and I do not throw my words to the wind, Julie replied respectfully. A week later, Julia made six aprons and was paid for them. During this period of time, she was approached by one more woman with a request to make a business suit. As it turned out, Julia was recommended to her by the first client. Julia realized that now not one or two people know about her, but several and all of them are satisfied with her work. This means that she has a regular clientele who will go to her instead of to the atelier. And in fact, Julia got a lot of orders. She had to sleep for four or five hours to have time to sew products and at the same time she still worked at the main job. But the woman did not grumble at all to fate, that tired unbearable, because she knew for what she went for it. About half a year passed, as Julia titanically worked, and then her mother came to visit her from the village. Betty, as she saw her daughter, aghast and exclaimed, When was the last time you looked at yourself in the mirror? Dark circles under your eyes and you've lost so much weight. This hurt Ariana, who was in the kitchen. The girl ran out to meet her grandmother and shouted with delight. Grandma, what a good girl you are that you came. You go ahead and scold your mom. You're doing everything right. I told her how many times that she only sees her sewing machine. I can't remember when we used to go out together. She even writes at night and you can't stop her. Maybe your mom will listen to you. Your granddaughter should have called me and told me everything and I would have come sooner in giving your mom a good kick. Soon, when Ariana went to bed, Betty began to reproach her daughter. Her mother told Julia that she should not work so hard, and she also said that all money could not be earned. The old woman added to all this that Ariana was living with her mother, but in fact she was on her own and nothing good could come out of it. Julia closed her eyes tiredly and answered her mother, I understand everything, but I need that money. You know very well that I can't earn money any other way. You yourself remember the sad experience of my business in the trade. I still have some leftover merchandise, 
I need to accumulate the initial capital, and then I'll take a loan and then start organizing my own business. Don't you know that work can kill a horse? You and your sewing will be dead before you know it. You're scary to look at. Ariana's right. You can't see anything around you except your machine. You're not even trying to organize your personal life. You look at Tatiana, your sister. She has found a young man and they are going to apply to the registry office. And you are all alone and alone, Betty said mournfully. Mammy, if you came to lecture me, you're wasting your time. I won't give up what I've done. I'm glad for my sister, and may she be luckier this time than she was the first time she married, and I don't meet a man at the moment, because I have a goal and I will pursue it. As for Ariana, at least she sees that her mom is working for her own good. After a few days, Betty left. She still couldn't convince her daughter to relieve herself at least a little from work. And this fact upset the old woman very much, for she feared that Julia would thus undermine her health. A year passed as Julia worked hard, saving money to spare, and she decided to make a full estimate for the opening of the business. When the calculations were ready, she was horrified to notice that at this rate, she would have to work for at least two more years. The woman thought long and hard about what she should do and decided that she would take a large loan from the bank. Julia soon received the loan and immediately quit her job. She found a small space and rented it, then bought professional equipment for two seamstresses. Julia realized that she could only hire one person at this stage. So soon Julia opened the atelier and advertised in the local newspaper. The woman warned her regular customers that she would not work from home. And so Julia, together with another seamstress, started working in the atelier. Sure, let your masters come to me and I'll take their measurements. But let's talk about the time frame right away. All right. I'll wait. I almost forgot. You told me about the discount. Is it relevant or was it just a figure of speech? Why would you say that? I promised you that I will reduce the price and I do not throw my words to the wind, Julia replied respectfully. A week later, Julia made six aprons and was paid for them. During this period of time, she was approached by one more woman with a request to make a business suit. As it turned out, Julia was recommended to her by the first client. Julia realized that now not one or two people know about her but several and all of them are satisfied with her work. This means that she has a regular clientele who will go to her instead of to the atelier. And in fact, Julia got a lot of orders. She had to sleep for four or five hours to have time to sue products and at the same time she still worked at the main job. But the woman did not grumble at all to fate, that tired unbearable, because she knew for what she went for it. About half a year passed, as Julia titanically worked, and then her mother came to visit her from the village. Betty, as she saw her daughter, aghast and exclaimed, When was the last time you looked at yourself in the mirror? Dark circles under your eyes, and you've lost so much weight. This hurt Ariana, who was in the kitchen. The girl ran out to meet her grandmother and shouted with delight, Grandma, what a good girl you are that you came. You go ahead and scold your mom, you're doing everything right. I told her how many times that she only sees her sewing machine. I can't remember when we used to go out together. She even writes at night, and you can't stop her. Maybe your mom will listen to you. Your granddaughter should have called me and told me everything, and I would have come sooner and given your mom a good kick. Soon, when Ariana went to bed, Betty began to reproach her daughter. Her mother told Julia that she should not work so hard, and she also said that all money could not be earned. The old woman added to all this that Ariana was living with her mother, but in fact she was on her own and nothing good could come out of it. Julia closed her eyes tiredly and answered her mother, I understand everything, but I need that money. You know very well that I can't earn money any other way. You yourself remember the sad experience of my business in the trade. I still have some leftover merchandise. I need to accumulate the initial capital, and then I'll take a loan and then start organizing my own business. Don't you know that work can kill a horse? You and your sewing will be dead before you know it. You're scary to look at. Ariana's right. You can't see anything around you except your machine. You're not even trying to organize your personal life. You look at Tatiana, your sister. She has found a young man and they are going to apply to the registry office. And you are all alone and alone, Betty said mournfully. Mammy, if you came to lecture me, you're wasting your time. I won't give up what I've done. I'm glad for my sister, 
and may she be luckier this time than she was the first time she married, and I don't meet a man at the moment, because I have a goal and I will pursue it. As for Ariana, at least she sees that her mom is working for her own good. After a few days, Betty left. She still couldn't convince her daughter to relieve herself at least a little from work. And this fact upset the old woman very much, for she feared that Julia would thus undermine her health. A year passed, as Julia worked hard, saving money to spare, and she decided to make a full estimate for the opening of the business. When the calculations were ready, she was horrified to notice that at this rate, she would have to work for at least two more years. The woman thought long and hard about what she should do and decided that she would take a large loan from the bank. Julia soon received the loan and immediately quit her job. She found a small space and rented it, then bought professional equipment for two seamstresses. Julia realized that she could only hire one person at this stage. So soon Julia opened the atelier and advertised in the local newspaper. The woman warned her regular customers that she would not work from home. And so Julia, together with another seamstress, started working in the atelier. God forbid. Why would you think that? I was just looking out the window when I saw you with a gentleman. That's why I asked. But if you don't want to, you don't have to answer. It's just an acquaintance. And he decided to walk me home. The rest of the day, Julia thought about Alexander and involuntarily she imagined him embracing her and kissing her passionately on the lips. These thoughts made her hot because she had not been in bed with a man for a long time. The next day, Julia received a call from Alexander at lunchtime and again proposed to meet. Julia gladly agreed. She chose her outfit carefully before the next date. She wanted to charm this man. Before leaving the apartment, the woman once again looked at her reflection in the mirror with a critical eye and was satisfied. Only then she hurried to meet him. That day, they also took a little walk and Alexander suggested to come to his rented apartment to visit him. The man hinted that he had a surprise for his companion. Julia was intrigued and agreed, and only should the couple enter the apartment, as Alexander pulled the woman to himself and gently said, You drive me crazy. I didn't sleep all night and thought about you. Whatever you want to do to me, but I'm going to kiss you now. Julia didn't say anything in response, but only closed her eyes. Immediately, the woman felt Alexander's lips digging into hers. She did not push the man away, as she herself dreamed about it. And soon the couple from the hallway moved to the tacta. Julia gave herself completely the passion. Only after a while the man released his partner from his embrace. The woman lay covered with a plate and admired Alexander, who at this moment gently guided his finger on her lips. Julia at this moment was ready to stay here with this man forever from the fact that she actually felt good. After a few hours, the woman looked at her watch and said that it was time to go home. The man responded by saying that he wouldn't let her go anywhere today. Julia laughed happily at this statement. She was pleased to hear it and said aloud, have you forgotten that I have a daughter who is going to lose her mom? Call me and tell me you're spending the night at a buddy's house. You're not a little kid. Why should I teach you? Besides, your daughter's a grown-up. Is that how you want me to stay? Why ask obvious things? The man mumbled and kissed the woman passionately again. Julia didn't come home that night. She had called in advance and warned Ariana that she would stay at her friend's house until morning. The daughter was surprised since her mother never slept out, but she did not ask her mother any unnecessary questions. Three days passed as Alexander arrived, they sought each other every day, and soon the man said that it was time for him to return home. This news immediately upset Julia, she did not want to part with this man, she was very good with him in all plans. The man immediately noted, his departure upset the woman and then he said without any problems, you and I are good together. Maybe let's get together? Is this marriage proposal you just made? Why not? Will you marry me? Of course, yes, I have long been in love with you, as we corresponded with you for a month. Then I was madly drawn to you, happily answered Julia and reached out to kiss the chosen one on the lips. The couple decided that the man would first go on a shift and then come to Julia and they will apply for a registry office here. The woman first offered to live with her explaining that she had her own business here. Alexander was only happy about it and explained why. He said that he lived with his mother in a Khrushchevka house and there would be no place to live. 
Soon Alexander left. Julia was very longing for the chosen one. The woman realized long ago that she was in love with this man without memory. She dreamed of living with this man as a single entity for the rest of her life. And she was completely sure that her lover also felt the same way about her, because he told her so. Julie wanted to shove her feelings to the whole world. She suddenly felt the need to tell someone that she had a loved one. So she decided to call her sister and share it with her. She dialed Leslie's number and as soon as she heard her voice, she said, Hi, I'm going to shock you now, but you'll be the first to know the amazing news that your sister is getting married soon. What do you think of my news? No way. And you didn't tell me you had a boyfriend this whole time. How could you do that? Come on. Tell us who he is and what he's eating. We're not going to eat him. I still need him. You can't imagine how happy I am. I fell in love like a girl, only thinking about Sasha, Julia said and then continued to tell about her lover. Leslie listened attentively to her sister, occasionally interrupting to ask an interesting question about Julia's beau. At the end of the conversation, Leslie asked if she could tell her mother about it so that she might be pleased. Julia thought for a moment and then assented. Half an hour after talking to her sister, Julia got a call from her mom. Betty congratulated her daughter heartily and asked when she would come to the village with her lover to introduce her. Julia at a loss to say that this topic with Alexander did not discuss. And then she assured her mother that as soon as her lover arrived, they would mutually decide everything and inform about the day of arrival in advance. Now Julia thought about how to inform her daughter that her mom was getting married soon. The woman thought about it for a long time and then decided that it was necessary to tell it as it really was. And when Ariana appeared at home, she asked her daughter to sit down for a serious conversation. The girl looked at her mother in amazement and complied with the request. And Julia, sighing, blurted out, I want to tell you that I am marrying the man you saw with me. Wow, you sure know how to surprise a mom. And now I'm guessing which friend you slept at the other night. So all I can do is congratulate you. You deserve a happy family life. Grandmother is always talking about it, said Ariana with a smile, who was really happy for her mom. Daughter, I was so afraid to see your negative reaction. I love you so much. What are you talking about? Why else should I have a bad attitude to the event when my mom is happy? Asked the girl in surprise. Oh, well, let's not talk about that. I'd rather tell you about it, the mother said happily. Time flew and soon Alexander arrived. The couple filed an application and after Julia took the chosen one to introduce his relatives in the village. Betty, when she saw the future son-in-law, she mentally noted that the man is outwardly quite attractive and when communicating this man seemed to her a pleasant interlocutor. But literally the next day the pensioner slightly changed her first impression and all because of the fact that she was visited by the granddaughter of her neighbor, who at that time was 19 years old. Betty immediately noticed how appraisingly Alexander looked at the girl's body. It was this look that the lady of the house did not like. And when the moment came, her mother turned to Julia and asked her if she was sure of this man. Julia looked at her mother in bewilderment and answered that she had known Alexander for more than three months. Betty didn't ask her daughter anything more. After returning from the village, the couple filed an application and the man moved in with Julia. Ariana welcomed her mother's chosen one, which pleased Julia, who was worried about how the relationship between the two loved ones would develop. Soon there was a marriage ceremony. The wedding couple did not begin to play on this, insisted the bride. She did not want a flamboyant show. Alexander did not challenge the desire of his wife. They just celebrated this significant day in a restaurant in the circle of relatives and close friends. Julia was only surprised that Sasha's mother did not come to the birth and asked a question on this topic. Why isn't your mom here? This road is tiring for her. Don't worry, she will be happy for us at home, especially I will send her pictures. Time moved on slowly. Ariana graduated from high school and went to Washington, D.C. for medical school. The couple lived alone. Alexander traveled every other month on a shift. At such times, Julia was very worried that with her lover may happen, and she was also wildly jealous of him. The woman even once asked him to quit the job, but he refused the offer saying, I don't want to sit on my wife's neck like a burden. I must have my own personal finances. 
so let's find you a suitable job here. The wages are small here and I am already used to working there. I want to save up for a car. I've been wanting one for a long time. I want to buy a Ford, said the husband. The woman took her husband's dream and even thought that it is possible to present such a gift to her spouse on his birthday. True, at the moment she could not do it, because the money she had on her card, she was collecting to pay off the loan in the bank. But this idea of gifting an auto to her husband had become her dream come true. Life continued to go on evenly as suddenly an unfortunate thing happened. Leslie called and informed her that her mom had died of a heart attack. Julia howled like a wounded animal at this message. She shouted and beat the wall with her fist. She was completely knocked out by the news. The woman considered herself guilty that her mother was gone and could not understand the reason why she blamed herself for it. Betty was buried next to her husband. The sisters thought that mom would approve of their choice because even after the departure of dad in the next world, she continued to love him and left already without a husband has not once responded to the advances of other men. A year had passed since Betty's death. During this time, Ariana met a young man with whom she came to her mother's house to introduce her to her future son-in-law. Julia was confused when she heard this. She didn't expect her daughter to get married so early. The woman asked Ariana a question. Are you sure about your feelings for this guy? It's just that marriage is a very important step in life. You have to weigh everything carefully before you can become legally married. Mommy, of course I've thought about it, and I've already met his parents. They have warmly accepted me and even call me daughter-in-law. So you should get ready for the wedding. I was shocked by your message, my daughter. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I remember when you also shocked me with the message that you're marrying Uncle Sasha. So you and I are even, the girl said with a laugh. Well, let's think about what to give you newlyweds for the wedding. With a smile, said the mother of her daughter and gently stroked Ariana on the cheek. And you don't have to think, I can tell you, give us a car. In Washington without it is very difficult. And the parents of the chosen one have already told us that they will give us the keys to a one-room apartment. So we're gonna be a well-off young family. Soon Ariana left with her fiancé. And after her departure to Julia approached her husband and a little sarcastically said that he heard the conversation about the car. The woman looked at her husband perplexed. She could not understand the tone of the spouse and asked what he was not satisfied. Alexander grinned and said that the girl was barely 18 and she immediately everything falls into her hands. And then he added that he had been saving for a car for several years and could not raise the necessary amount. Julia was a little stunned by what she heard and said, but Ariane is my daughter and she's getting married. If you heard the whole conversation, you should have heard that the young man's parents are giving them an apartment. You obviously didn't hear me. That's too bad. The man said dryly and walked out of the apartment. Julia was perplexed by this short dialogue and also by the behavior of her spouse that he just left without saying a word. The man was gone for a long time and Julia called him, but her husband did not pick up the phone. The woman began to feel vague anxiety and tears came to her eyes. She didn't know what to think and was about to call the police when the front door opened and Alexander came in. Julia rushed to her husband and began to ask him where he was. The man said dryly that he was breathing fresh air. The woman in despair asked the chosen one to talk to her, but Alexander clearly said that he had no desire and wanted to sleep. The next day, the spouse was also speechless and Julia felt that she was guilty of something in front of him. It bothered her and she turned to her husband. Why are you doing this to me? Is it because of this car that I want to buy and give to my daughter? So this gift will be from both of us. Do what you want. I don't care. Wait, don't walk away from the conversation. You want a Ford and I remember that. Let you be patient for a while and after a while we'll buy you a new car. But now we have to make a gift for Ariana, exclaimed the woman and looked worriedly at her husband and he just silently went to the kitchen and began to make coffee. At the same moment, Julia ran in and holding back tears tried to hug her husband. Alexander pulled away and said that he was going on watch tomorrow. The woman looked frightened at her lover and quietly said that it was too early for him to go to work. She was afraid that Alexander would leave her. In response, the man said nothing. Julia touched her lover's hand and said, Okay, I understand you. You want me to help you with the purchase of a car. Let it be so. 
you may be right that it is too early to give such fancy gifts to the newlyweds as it is not known whether they will still live together or not. Look for a Ford that we can buy, and I'll talk to my daughter about getting a car for them a little later. And after these words, the woman looked at her spouse, who as if nothing had happened was cooking coffee in a turbine. Alexander simply ignored his wife. Julia could not stand it and screamed hysterically. Do you not hear me at all? I offered you to buy a car, and you don't even look at me. Alexander turned and pulled the already crying spouse to himself, hugged her gently and quietly said to calm her down, and then lifted the woman in his arms and carried her to the sofa, where he began to tenderly shower her with kisses. After that, the couple had intimacy and Julia, Lying on the shoulder of her lover thought that she agreed to do everything to make it good for her and Sasha. The next day the woman transferred an in sum to the card of the spouse, and he began to look for a car. And soon in the yard there was already a red Ford, which belonged to Alexander. The man was unspeakably happy about this purchase, which did not hide from Julia. But the woman felt awkward in relation to her daughter because she realized that if Ariana in the near future will apply to the registry office with her boyfriend, she will not have time to save enough money to buy a car. A few months passed after the purchase of the car, and the woman began to notice that her spouse somehow cooled to her. This made Julia think. She tried to find out from her husband why he became indifferent to her as a woman. Alexander made a perplexed face and asked, Are you even? What are you talking about? You know exactly what I'm talking about. It seems to me that you ignore me as a woman. I do not understand you ladies at all. You make up yourselves. What the hell? And honest men all this hang. Have you ever thought that when I come back from my shift, I also drive a cab to earn an extra dime? You and your atelier, you don't see anything around you. What are you talking about? I'm there three or four times a week. Maybe you can explain your behavior, Julia said nervously. The man looked at his wife with a sizzling look, but did not answer anything. The woman shivered involuntarily from the gaze of her lover. She had never seen Alexander look at her like that. And the head of the family then packed up and left the house. Julia thought that this was the last unpleasant incident for today, as at the same moment she heard the doorbell ringing. She jumped up excitedly and ran to open it, thinking that her spouse had returned but had forgotten to take the keys to the front doors. However, when she opened the door, she saw a happy daughter with a bouquet of flowers. The girl happily hugged her mother, and then noticing that her mother's face was not happy asked her, What has happened here? And why did Uncle Alexander sit in the driver's seat of the red Ford? Nothing happened. It's Alexander's car. I gave him money. And you why without warning, in case I was not at home? Barely audible mother said, What do you mean you gave him money? But you promised to give us a car for the wedding and my fiance had heard about it, and we have already informed my fiance's parents, Ariana said confusedly and then added hastily. I came without warning because I came to tell them that we have applied to the registry office and we are getting married in a month. Mom, how could you do that? You just gave us hope and then you didn't fulfill your promise. How am I going to face the groom's parents and my favorite person? Now I'm going to be seen as a blabbermouth after all this. We'll figure it out, my mother said quietly. You talk about it so calmly. It takes a lot of money to buy a car. I didn't expect you to do that. I don't mind that you manage your money yourself, since you earned it with your own labor. But why make empty promises to me in public? You can thank yourself now, but there will be no wedding. I'm embarrassed to look the chosen one in the eye after all this. I don't want him to think I'm just like you. Ariana exclaimed passionately. Stop being hysterical. I'll explain everything to your young man and his parents myself. You will get the car, but a little later. Yes, how can you not realize that it's not about the car, it's about what you promised, and your words turned out to be nothing. As they say, what you said, it turned out to be air, or rather shaking the air. With these words the girl handed the flowers and without waiting for a response jumped out of the apartment. Julia tried to catch up with her daughter and followed Ariana out of the entrance and immediately found out that she was barefoot. The woman gave her daughter a longing look and then returned home. Julia sat down on the sofa and only at that moment she burst into tears. At midnight her husband returned and went to bed without speaking. Julia realized that there was no point in explaining today and left the conversation until morning. 
All that night, the woman spent practically without sleep. She waited for the morning. And as soon as it began to dawn, Julia sat down opposite her husband, waiting for him to wake up. After a while, Alexander stretched and opened his eyes. His wife immediately wished good morning and only wanted to start a conversation, as the man without giving her a chance to say said, Yes, I was wrong yesterday. Let's not start this conversation again. Why are we going to spoil each other's mood in the morning? I've admitted my mistake, and I don't want to fight before I leave for work. How are you going back on watch? But you still have three days before you leave, said his wife worriedly. I only found out yesterday, called a little earlier, but here, really, I'm not to blame. And now, you let's make breakfast, and I'll go to the car to get my suitcase, so if you can pack me for the shift, you like to do it, said the man and gently stroked his wife's hand. Julia felt a little encouragement from the man's words, because he recognized that yesterday he was wrong. The woman got up from the couch and smiled gently at her husband. Then she went to the kitchen to make an omelette and brew coffee in a turbo, which was so fond of her Alexander. Julia leisurely prepared breakfast in the kitchen, while mentally scolding her husband's bosses that so inapologetically interrupt the legal weekend and call to work earlier than scheduled. Soon, the woman set the table, where she put a plate of omelette and freshly brewed coffee, and at the same moment she heard the front door slam. She immediately guessed that her husband, who had gone to fetch his suitcase, had come in. The woman affectionately called her favorite person to go to breakfast. Alexander came up and said with a smile that he had already caught the smell of coffee in the hallway. Julia smiled in response and wished a pleasant appetite, and herself went to the living room to start packing her spouse for the watch, and only she wanted to go out, as she heard Sasha's phrase. Honey, I need money to buy spare parts. Wait, but last month you already bought a car and not a small amount of money. Don't be a little girl, a car is a woman, and it needs care and attention. And don't forget, I used the car to get to the shift, and it's not always a good road, so the parts just fly, said the head of the family nonchalantly. Maybe then you better go to work, as before not on your own transport. This way, we will save on gasoline and spare parts. Why do you think I need a car if I don't have to drive it? The man said unhappily. Julia immediately realized that her husband was not satisfied with her answer, so she hurried to say that the money will naturally give. And then the woman added that she would go slowly to pack her things, so as not to do it at the last minute. Alexander smiled contentedly and nodded in agreement. Julia walked to the living room and began pulling her spouse's clean underwear out of the dresser. She stacked her husband's clothes on the couch. Then she took the suitcase and placed it next to the linens and opened its lid. She noticed a corner of a piece of paper sticking out of a side pocket. Julia tugged at it, and another one appeared behind it. The woman pulled out two pieces of paper and was surprised to find that they were two sea vouchers one in her husband's name and the other for a woman she didn't know. Julia looked at the two documents for a long time and could not understand why these two papers were in her husband's suitcase. And then it dawned on her lighting fast, that's why he was allegedly called a little earlier to work, and why her husband called to her. The woman realized that the lover has a mistress on the side. Julia, holding the vouchers in her hands, went to the kitchen, where the unsuspecting Alexander was having breakfast. The woman stretched out the papers to her spouse and barely restrained from indignation said, You said a word called, so you need spare parts? Why did you forget to tell me that you are going on a trip with a lady you rest? The man looked at the documents and then at his wife and calmly said, So you found it. Well, it's even better. What did you think? I will wait for you to get cellulite, to walk in a tattered darn robe, when there are young beautiful beauties who do not sobriety as you. Yeah, plus they're willing to give you money without reminding you. You're the one who has to beg. I don't like it, and I'm glad you found these vouchers. I don't have to explain everything to you. I hope you're not a completely stupid woman and realize that I have long ago set you horns. Realize that not only goats are horny, but goats too. Yes, how could you? I love you with all my heart, and you just spit in my soul. I had a fight with my daughter because of you. Did you love me at all? Or did you only care about my bank account? What love? It's a fairy tale made up for the stupid, of which you are one. By the way, 
who I'm going with is also from the same subspecies, but younger than you, and her father is some official. And these vouchers are at her expense. And please do not reproach me now in anything. You yourself wanted to marry me, and I gave my consent. But the fact is that although you have a business, but still not really stand on your feet, because you have a loan hanging around your neck, and you have previously silent about it, and only boasted that the owner of the studio, sarcastically said Alexander. What a scoundrel you are. Get out of here now. Sure, I'll just finish my breakfast, and you pack your things please, the man said with a smirk. The woman grabbed the plate with the rest of the omelet and threw it on the floor with all of her might. Alexander grinned and got up from the table. Then he went to the living room, where he hastily threw his things into a suitcase, then dressed and left the apartment without a word. Julia, after her husband had gone, squatted down and wept desperately. She cried for a long time and then forced herself to pull herself together and call her daughter. However, Ariana's cell phone was out of range. The woman made several attempts throughout the day, but to no avail. At this, Julia paused and looked at her interlocutor, who was sitting in the car and going through a rosary. The woman wiped away the tears that had come during the narration of her own life story. And at the same moment, Steve turned his head to his companion and quietly asked, Can I ask you a few questions? Sure. Why didn't you jump off the bridge when your first husband died? I had my mom's support at the time. Yes, and I perceived the tragedy very differently at that time, because my daughter was small and close to me. I could not leave her just like that without me, quietly answered the interlocutor. And now, what motivated you to go to this bridge? You see, I cannot understand it. A man deceived you, it happens quite often, as they say not uncommon, and you decided that now there's no point in living, where's the logic in that? It's hard to explain, but I'll try. The thing is that I lived for a long time after the death of the first spouse alone. I had a relationship with two men, which quickly ended before it began. And then there was Alexander, so all of himself well-groomed with seductive speeches and able to please a woman, and I was this man simply enslaved, if I may say so. And here he not only betrayed me, but just used me. But this is not the main reason. I let my daughter down, I hurt her. She left and disappeared without a trace. I called the dormitory but they said they don't house students during the summer. Ariana's cell phone is always out of range, and I don't know my daughter's fianca's address. I realized that my girl just cut me out of her life. There was no way to find her, and I had no one else to confide in. I just felt empty and unnecessary in this life. I just didn't want to live overnight, and something in my soul noted that all this can be stopped at once, and so I decided to take this step. But your words, as if brought me back to reality, that I will only make myself better, but not others. Julia was silent with her head down low. She was no longer embarrassed that tears were streaming down her cheeks. Julia felt relieved that at least someone knew what she was feeling at the moment. Steve was sitting thoughtfully. He saw a woman who was confused and had chosen the wrong solution to her situation. The man was silent for a few minutes, and then he spoke. What are you going to do next? I don't know. I just want to find my daughter and apologize to her. That's not a problem. I'll help you find Ariana. I would like to hear something else about Alexander. What will you do with him? The woman thought and was silent for a while, and then she looked at her interlocutor and said that she would like to teach him a lesson, but she didn't have such an opportunity. And Julia added that she felt sorry for the girl with whom Alexander was having fun at the sea and messing with her mind. Steve listened to the woman's answer and then said with a smile, you can take revenge on this man, but first admit to yourself that you have become indifferent to him in reality. You know, I honestly don't care about him anymore. It's like a veil has fallen from my eyes and I wonder how I could find something in this man. I can even more frankly say that most likely I was led by passion and the fact that approaching crisis age. All the same, 40 years old is not for every woman directly happiness. But will you help me find Ariana? Julia said. I did not throw words to the wind is what you said to your first client. And now tell me how soon Alexander returns from the resort and whether you remembered the name of the woman for whom there was a second ticket. Julia thought about it and said what date her husband was coming back, but she couldn't remember the name of the woman for whom the voucher had been issued. 
Steve scratched the bridge of his nose and said that now the most important thing was to invite Alexander and his companion to Julia's house, and there would be a surprise waiting for them. The man also added that it was necessary to convince her husband to come with a new companion with whom he went to the resort. Julia looked at the interlocutor in surprise and asked how to do it. Steve thought for a moment and answered, Say that you have a gift for him in the form of a cash equivalent, and you are ready to give the finances only if you see who he traded you for. And immediately say that there will be no scandal, you just woke up female curiosity. That's gonna be hard to do. I'm not very good at lying. Oh wait, I remembered who the second voucher was written out to. Slayda Skorobovitova and Alexander also said that her father was an official, Julia said happily. Great. Now we can get down to business. Here is my phone number, and you give me yours. We have only a week left before Alexander arrives, and I'll have to work hard. But you don't do anything stupid, only if you call your daughter from time to time. And if there's any news, call me too. I'll take you home now, and you promise me you'll go to bed with a good night's sleep. Tell me, why are you helping me, and how do you intend to punish Alexander? Juliet asked the questions quietly. I have already told you that after I was able to stop you on the bridge, I am now responsible for you. And as for the punishment, let it be a pleasant surprise for you. Let's say compensation for moral damage. Now let's go. Give me your coordinates. Steve drove the new acquaintance to the given address and asked to be always in touch. Julia vowed and hurried to her home. She just wanted to take a pill for a headache and go to sleep. She felt very tired and only as soon as the woman drank the medicine and laid down on the sofa, as at the same moment fell asleep. It had been two days since the encounter. Julia really wanted to dial Steve to find out about the search for Ariana, but she remembered that the man had said as soon as he had information he would call her back. Julia waited and prayed to God that Steve would find her daughter, and on the third day the man called and said that he had talked to Ariana and immediately warned that the girl was still angry and not ready to meet with her mother. Steve explained that he had found Julia's daughter thanks to his connections. The woman listened to the interlocutor and discouragedly asked, When will I be able to see her? Very soon, in a few days Alexander arrives, then you can meet. And your daughter also asked me to tell you that soon you will become a grandmother. Ariana loves you very much and wants to see you. It's just that she's still carrying that childish grudge at the moment. How pregnant? She's just a child, isn't she? It can't be exclaimed the woman, she couldn't believe that her girl was pregnant. You promised me not to lose your temper, especially now that you're about to become a grandmother. By the way, I congratulate you on this too. The interlocutor said cheerfully and disconnected the connection without waiting for an answer. And the long-awaited day came when Alexander returned from vacation. Julia called him and asked for a meeting. The man initially spoke rudely, but when he heard the purpose of the visit and the amount of remuneration, he was pleased, but agreed on one condition. That part of the money would be transferred as a deposit. Julia was squeamish, but transferred a small part of the money. A couple of hours before Alexander's arrival, Steve came to Julia's apartment, accompanied by a pretty blonde woman and an unfamiliar gentleman. The landlady looked at the guests with bewilderment as she suddenly saw her daughter behind them. The girl rushed to her mother and began to beg her for forgiveness. Julia hugged Ariana and herself apologized to her. All this scene was observed by the guests. The meeting of mother and daughter was interrupted by Steve, who said, Let's go to the apartment, so that Alexander did not see us here such a cluster, in case he comes before the appointed hour. And already Julia and her daughter were standing near the window talking. The others were talking among themselves when suddenly the bell rang. Steve turned to the man whose name was Mickey. Do you remember when you will need to leave the other room? Steve then turned to Ariana. You might as well hide for now, and I'll hide with you. Our exit will be later. Julia watched this process with interest, and then she was already approached by Steve, who asked her to open the door and trust the blonde girl he had brought. The landlady opened the door and saw her husband with a long-legged brunette on the threshold. Alexander smiled radiantly and entered the apartment and without preamble said, I have fulfilled my part of the agreement, now come on you. And only he said it, as the blonde came out into the hallway and smiling cordially said, My goodness, who do I see? Alexander, hello. 
You disappeared so unexpectedly, but I understand that you are no longer interested in me as a money bag, as I have problems in business, but you were in a hurry. Now I'm doing fine. I even opened another hotel as you evaporated or rather swept over to this woman and the blonde pointed at the landlady, not letting Alexander speak. The woman continued, but you still had a good meal at my place or rather at my expense, I bought you a one room apartment. And now I see you already blondes and shades are not interested in brunettes and even younger. Your demands are changing every day. At this moment, Alexander rudely interrupted the woman and said sternly, what kind of surface is going on here? I don't know you citizen, and it's the first time I see you. What one room apartment? Stop talking nonsense. And then Julia entered the conversation, who realized what play started Steve, she said. Maybe you don't know me either. I also had to thank you for the comforts and gave you the money to buy a Ford, which you dreamed of for so many years. By the way, your companion must have thanked you too. For all I know she paid for the resort. And you told me that you got a money bags, whose daddy is an official. Now I understand who was talking about your companion. And then Steve, Ariana, and Mickey came out. When the brunette saw the older man, she exclaimed, Daddy, what are you doing here? I don't understand anything. Mickey looked sternly at his daughter and said that he would talk to her at home and then turned to Alexander. To avoid punishment, I suggest that you make amends to all the ladies. Otherwise, I will have to involve influential people so that you do not live sweetly on this earth. I hope I explained it clearly. Alexander stood silent. He had nothing to say. He was just being pushed against the wall at the moment and smeared against it. The man wanted to say something, as at the same second the brunette turned to him and slapped him. At this action, the girls all laughed, and Julia spoke up. You can give another slap, but already for me, I do not want to dirty my hands just. Alexander was the first to leave, followed by Mickey and his daughter and then the blonde. There were only three people left in the apartment. Ariana saw that Steve couldn't wait to talk to her mom alone, so she told her mother that she wanted to go visit her friend and tell her about the Alphonse's woes. Julia jokingly threatened her daughter with her fist, and she responded by showing her tongue and running out of the apartment. As soon as Ariana left, Steve looked thoughtfully at the landlady. The woman involuntarily embarrassed and said, are you trying to accuse me of something again now? Not at all. I want to know if you feel better now. The man answered the question with a question. Yes. And I keep thinking, maybe we were brought together by fate on that bridge, because you are like a wounded bird, and I am a shot wolf, Steve said quietly. After that, the man approached the woman and said that Julia had a phone number and he would be glad to hear from her at any time of the day. And then he smiled and added that about today's lynching will be known to the population very soon, as in his opinion, Ariana will try to be a part of it. And in fact, many people in the city soon learned about this case. They ought that how cleverly Julia had taught the cheater a lesson, but it was not entirely her merit, and Steve was the one who came up with the idea of how to punish a dishonest man. People then for a long time judged about it laughing at the grief of a cheater, and Alexander had to soon urgently retreat from the city, but he gave the Ford to Julia, and the daughter of the official had to pay the money for travel from the finances that he saved from his earnings for the car. Except that the blonde refused the compensation, as she was just playing a role to bring Alexander out.